estate the first the first part of the afternoon, afternoon session, uh, the first speaker is uh, Masahide Yamaguchi uh, from Tokyo Institute of Technology. So you have uh, 45 minutes for presentation and a 50 mi uh, five minutes for discussion. So Masahide, please start. Very sorry, I, I mistook <laughs> just then to go out, but uh, okay. Uh, yes, thank you for introduction. Uh, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the uh, organizer, especially Professor Hsu Min Ding. And uh, yeah, today uh, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, these topics. And actually, yeah, I'm asked to give some kind of review of the inflation. So uh, I gave uh, a talk on this title. And the topic is uh, how to uh, realize inflation and uh, uh, how to use inflation. And, uh, yeah, content of my talk is as follows. Uh, first, uh, I'm going to give some introduction and uh, oh, sorry, some howling. I don't know why. Maybe it's okay. And uh, uh, next, uh, I'm going to ask the following question. Yeah, how to realize the inflation? And uh, today, I'm going to introduce uh, two generic strategy. Uh, first one is to consider the kind of, uh, to consider a uh, diverging kinetic term, so-called uh, uh, pole inflation. Uh, this kind of model uh, fits the observations very well. So uh, this is a very promising way. Uh, another is a very common way uh, to introduce a shift symmetry, or uh, yeah, to introduce some symmetry like the shift symmetry to keep the potential flat. Okay. I'm going to uh, discuss uh, these two methods. And uh, next, uh, the next topics, yeah. Now, uh, inflation is now almost established, uh, not only theoretically, but also observationally. So the next question is uh, uh, how to use inflation. And uh, in this conference, uh, there are many particle physicists. So uh, I would like to suggest uh, to use inflation uh, as a collider, alternative to the uh, collider on us. And actually, during inflation, even very heavy particles inaccessible, inaccessible to uh, collider on us can be excited. So why don't you we use uh, inflation uh, as a collider? Okay. And finally, I summarize my talk. So uh, as you know, uh, inflation is an uh, accelerated expansion in the early universe, and uh, it makes uh, quite generic uh, predictions. Uh, for example, spatially flat universe is predicted. And also during inflation, uh, almost a scale invariant, adiabatic, and the Gaussian prime model density perturbations, as well as a, a prime model tensor perturbation, which is nothing but a gravitation wave. Then how to generate uh, such prime model fluctuation? So let me uh, briefly review uh, how to generate uh, such prime model density fluctuation during inflation. First, during inflations, uh, inflaton fields get the quantum fluctuations uh, like this one, okay, and fluctuate this way. And uh, inflation, during inflation, uh, this field uh, slows down around the potential. And finally, around some uh, infl inflation endpoints, it starts oscillation and decay into the radiation. Okay, so. Light figure represent a schematic uh, figure of the uh, time evolution of the energy density during uh, of the cosmology. So during inflation, energy density is almost constant. And uh, after inflation ends, uh, this field starts oscillation, which behave like a matter dominated universe, and finally decay into radiation, and the uh, radiation dominated universe is recovered. Okay. And uh, if the field fluctuates this way, as a quantum fluctuations. So the length becomes longer. So we have more time for inflation end, like this one. Okay. Then for such regions, uh, evolution of the energy density becomes like this one. On the other hand, if field fluctuates this way, we have a less uh, length uh, of the uh, infraton uh, uh, length. So we have a less time for inflation end. For such region, 
uh, energy density uh, behaves like that, this way. So at the late time, you can easily compare for different patch, we have uh, uh, energy density perturbations. Okay, this is a logic. How to uh, this scalar field perturbation is converted to the energy density perturbation. Okay, and we can easily estimate the magnitude of this density fluctuations. Uh, density fluctuations is nothing but uh, uh, as if a uh, fluctuation of the time because rho is proportional to uh, kind of uh, t square, one over t square or something like that. Okay. And uh, delta t is just nothing but uh, uh, time is uh, length divided by velocity. So just simply this one. Okay. So inserting and the time is almost a Happle inverse. Uh, sorry, Happle inverse. So by inserting these relations, uh, density perturbation is nothing but the ratio of the quantum fluctuation divided by the uh, length, uh, classical length during the H inverse. Okay. This is the uh, meaning of the density fluctuation. And we can easily estimate the, just by inserting the, this quantity, we get the Happle square divided by uh, velocity. Okay. And uh, this kind of fluctuation becomes uh, almost scale invariant and uh, uh, Gaussian fluctuation in general, because uh, to realize the inflation, for example, if we introduce a shift symmetry uh, and a Doshita invariance, uh, we have a time translation invariant. So even if when the each mode uh, exists the horizon, uh, it's almost the same due to the time translation invariance. It implies uh, almost a scale invariant. And uh, if we impose uh, this shift symmetries, uh, nonlinearity of the interaction is prohibited. So almost uh, fluctuation becomes uh, for the non interacting a kind of free field. So it's just a Gaussian. Okay. This is a generic mechanism uh, how to generate prime model density perturbation. And uh, this figure is a uh, constraint on the uh, constraint from the Planck satellite. And uh, uh, this is uh, uh, some uh, concrete constraint on the uh, Planck satellite again. Uh, this is the magnitude of the fluctuations, almost a 10 to minus 5 or 4. This is per spectrum. And the scalar spectrum index is slightly deviated from unity. It implies that. Uh, uh, Inflation expansion is slightly deviated from the uh, exact dojita because otherwise it never ends. Okay. And uh, this is a theoretical prediction. Okay. And in fact, uh, depending on the inflation models, uh, we can fit the observation of the data. Okay. Uh, this uh, region represents the allowed region from the observations, and some uh, prediction is given by. Uh, yeah, some points are the prediction from the uh, theoretical side. And uh, so-called attractor model, like uh, Stravinsky models, uh, fit the data uh, very well. Okay. Please keep in mind. And so now inflation is quite established, but uh, yeah, how to realize inflation? Okay. In fact, from the theoretical viewpoint. And today I'm going to uh, introduce two generic strategy to realize inflation. First one is a so-called uh, idea of the uh, pole inflation. Let's consider the uh, divergent kinetic term, like this one, uh, P is positive. Then if rho go approach zero, uh, this uh, kinetic term apparently diverge. Okay? It gets very large. So after making the canonical normalizations, uh, this kind of divergent kinetic term effectively suppress the any coupling. Okay. So, which implies that uh, uh, if we make a canonical normalizations, potential becomes uh, asymptotically flat. See? This is one generic strategy. Another is, uh, of course, introduce uh, some symmetry, like the shift symmetry. For example, uh, the theory is potential or theory is invariant under the, this kind of the constant shift. Okay. So action depends only on the kinetic term in general, if the shift symmetry is exact. 
So potentially becomes flat or even without a potential. Okay. Uh, I'm going to discuss uh, these two methods. And the first, uh, I try to introduce the uh, pole inflation or alpha attractor models, which uh, fits the observations very well. And uh, as a first step or as a typical example of such models, uh, I first discuss the uh, uh, very famous R square uh, inflation models invented by uh, Alexei Stalominsky. And uh, this, this model is quite simple. Uh, shall we consider the uh, action in, uh, with the Einstein Hilbert term plus R square term? R is a Ricci scale. And in order to analyze uh, this system, uh, we, inter we try to consider the uh, equivalent actions. And in general, if we have uh, this kind of the FR model, this model is uh, a part of the this FR models, okay? uh, we can easily consider the equivalent scalar tensor theories, uh, like this one. Okay? Uh, in order to consider, uh, instead of considering FR, we consider this. Uh, scalar tensor models. And uh, you can easily understand uh, these actions are quite uh, completely equivalent. If you take a variation of this equivalent action with respect to phi, uh, we get this expression. So unless second derivative of f with respect to phi is non-vanishing, uh, we get the uh, r equal phi. So by plugging into these relations, this is part is vanished, and we recover the original action. So this action is uh, completely equivalent as long as this condition is satisfied. And of course, this model satisfies these conditions in general. So this specific case, equivalent action is given by this one, by simple calculations. And uh, this, in these models, phi is not minimally coupled to the uh, scalar, rich scalar. So uh, to go into the Einstein frame, uh, we make a, a conformal transformation like this one. So we can uh, easily go into the Einstein frame with non-canonical kinetic pattern. So again, if we make a, a canonical, uh, sorry, uh, we, if we try to make uh, this kinetic term uh, canonical uh, by field, defi field definitions, uh, finally, we get uh, uh, this kind of uh, models. And uh, canonical kinetic term plus asymptotically flat potential. Okay. And uh, this is the reason why this simple action leads to inflation based on the, this asymptotically flat potential. Okay. And now, what kind of physics is behind, behind this simple model? Okay. And in order to address such questions, uh, these people extend this Stravinsky model to so-called conformal attractor models, uh, whose action is given by this one, okay. by introducing two fields, chi and phi, and the non-minimally coupling. Okay. And you can easily verify uh, this action respects the uh, local conformal symmetry given by this one. Okay. And also, if this function, generic function, is constant, uh, this model has a, a global SO11 symmetry with chi and phi. Okay. So now, in order to analyze these models, by use of the, this gauge degree of freedom, we can take uh, two different uh, gauge fixing. Okay. So first, we take a, a gauge fixing with chi square minus phi square equals 6. By using of the, this degree of freedom, we can easily choose this specific value. Okay. Then this chi and phi can be easily characterized by the hyperbolic function like this one. So by inserting this gauge fixing condition to original action, you can easily verify that this is nothing but six. So we can recover the Einstein Hilbert action plus some uh, scalar field. Okay. And the point is that now this phi becomes a function of the hyperbolic tangent of psi. And the hyperbolic tangent is this kind of uh, form of the uh, function, you see. So even if phi, bar phi change very much, hyperbolic tangent 
change is very small for large value files. So it means that as long as this original function f is smooth, the potential is effectively stretched for large value files. And uh, it means that the potential is effectively becomes flat. And in fact, Stravinsky model is uh, nothing but a special case of the, this model with the choice of this f. And this is the reason why Stravinsky model realizes asymptotically flat potential. Okay. And why this kind of behavior appears hyperbolic tangent or uh, stretching, stretch of the potential. In order to understand this feature, shall we take another gauge fixing by use of the local conformal symmetries? Okay. This case, uh, we simply just fix chi as a, a square root six. So by inserting uh, this gauge conditions, uh, we get uh, this one. Okay. So this in this uh, gauge fixings phi non-minimally coupled to the uh, Ricci scalar. So this is action is kind of the Jordan frame action. Okay. So again, by choosing the some conformal factor like this one, uh, we go can go into the Einstein frame. Okay. So now we get the Einstein frame action, uh, Einstein Hilbert action plus a non-canonical kinetic term of the scalar field. And you can easily see that this kinetic term has a pole. Okay. And uh, if you make a field redefinition like this one, uh, this hyperbolic tangent appears as a result of the, this pole features. Okay. So pole structure of the kinetic term effectively stretches the potential. Okay. This is the reason why this hyperbolic tangent appears. Okay. And the so-called alpha attractor model is a, a simple extension by introducing that some constant alpha for this uh, kinetic term of the potential. Okay. And the Stravinsky model is, uh, or include, yeah, conformal attractor including a Stravinsky model simply cor correspond to the alpha equal unity case. Okay. So with, this idea, okay, essential point to stretch the potential comes from the pole structure of the kinetic term. These people uh, propose a so-called uh, pole inflation okay. with keeping the previous idea in mind. Just simply consider Einstein-Hilbert action plus uh, some scalar field. But the point is that this a uh, kinetic term has a pole at a uh, low equal zero, and uh, it can be extended, uh, expanded in the low range series. Okay. And thanks to, I mean, the, uh, okay, like, so leading term, if the leading term of K is dominated by this part, T is positive, uh, we can make a canonical uh, transformation. Ah, sorry, uh, we can make uh, this non-canonical kinetic term to the canonical kinetic term by field redivisions. And uh, depending on the P, uh, we get uh, this kind of simple relations from the original value to the uh, canonically normalized field. Okay. And also for potential, we simply uh, assume uh, at row equal zero, it should be regular. Okay. And uh, if you, of course you can, consider the arbitrary powers, but the such power can be denormalized into the these powers. So without loss of generality, you can say that the uh, uh, first term, first correction come from the row. Okay. So by uh, with borrowing the, this simple assumption and uh, using the, these relations, we get uh, this kind of the asymptotically flat potential. And the idea is quite simple. You see, again, if this kinetic term diverging come at some point and uh, try to make this diverging kinetic term canonically normalizations, then as long as the original potential is regular, 
it's effectively stretched uh, for the large field of uh, phi. Okay. This is the essential point. And very interestingly, alpha attractor models uh, I uh, introduced in the previous slides uh, correspond to the uh, P equal two case. And the interesting point is that scalar spectrum index is, uh, does not depend on the these coefficient at all, just depends on the power of P. Okay. And if we set P equal two, and capital N is a e folding number, and if we take a 50 or 60, uh, this models complete uh, will fit the uh, observation very well. On the other hand, the tensor to scale ratio uh, depends not only uh, on this P, but also uh, on this coefficient of AP. Okay. So depending on the, this magnitude, tensor to scale ratio uh, can be tuned. So this is in some sense a generic reason why alpha attractor model and uh, r square models uh, fit the observation very well, just by inserting uh, p equal two and n equal 50 or 60, uh, scalar tensor to ratio, uh, sorry, uh, uh, NS becomes a 0.96 or something like that. Okay. So, Everyone is wondering what kind of physics is behind this pole structure with order of two. You see, uh, unfortunately, I have not yet uh, understood uh, this future uh, very well. So, uh, of course, some proposal have been already uh, discussed, but uh, uh, not yet good, uh, uh, very good, very established ideas. So now let's move on to the uh, another uh, interesting possibility to realize inflation, uh, so-called shift symmetry and or some extensions. Okay. And the shift symmetry is nothing but the theory should be uh, invariant under the constant shift of the field. So as long as the shift is exact, uh, action can depends only on the uh, derivative of uh, scalar field. And so simplest example is just uh, nothing but uh, it can depend on only the first derivative. And uh, this is so-called a K inflation model. Of course, as long as the shift symmetry is exact, inflation never ends. So to end inflations, slight phi dependence is necessary, okay? In a realistic situation. And uh, it implies that a kinetic term of inflation is, inflation is not necessarily canonical. And uh, it can be uh, described by the generic function of phi and x, which is so-called uh, k inflation proposed by these people. And this shift symmetry actually allows even for the higher derivative like box phi. Okay. And the uh, uh, action may include even the higher derivative term, box phi or even box square, box phi square or something like that. And in fact, uh, if we extend this shift symmetry uh, to the further so-called Galilean symmetry uh, in the flat space, uh, we can get uh, uh, this kind of, uh, we can clarify the action which uh, respect uh, this Galilean symmetry in the flat space. And actually we have a five, only five terms uh, allowed. Uh, different from shift symmetry. Shift symmetry is just by phi itself is a constant shift. But this Galilean shift symmetry is a velocity is a constant shift. Okay. This is something like a, a Galilean symmetry in the Newton theory. So people say that uh, this symmetry is uh, Galilean shift symmetry. Okay. And in this specific case, uh, even though Lagrangian has a second order derivative, but the equation motion is still second order, so no ghost. And but uh, you may wonder, why do we need to consider such higher derivative term? You see, second order, third order, fourth order, so yeah, no end. But uh, uh, it's quite interesting feature if we consider the uh, higher derivative term. First point is that uh, 
uh, please remain, remember that. It is impossible to break null energy condition stably within K inflation. K inflation is, is nothing but the most general action uh, made of the phi and the first derivative of the mu phi. So as long as we consider the first derivative, uh, it, this feature implies that primordial ten tensor perturbations has always a let spectrum. Okay. Well, if we consider uh, this model as a uh, dark energy, it implies that equation of states W, which is defined by ratio of the P to uh, energy density, is always larger than the minus unity. Okay. So if observation suggests this equation of state is less than minus one, uh, we have to extend our theory beyond the K equation. And uh, in order to discuss this future, uh, let me remind you of the uh, narrow energy condition. Okay. What is the narrow energy condition? Narrow energy condition says that energy momentum tensor times some narrow vector uh, must be always uh, larger than zero, you see, or positive. Okay. And this is the weakest energy condition among all of the local classical energy conditions. Okay. And uh, what does it mean? Okay. So as a concrete example, let's consider the perfect fluid whose energy momentum tensor is given by this. Okay. So narrow energy conditions implies that uh, by inserting this one, you see this part just vanish and this part is just positive definite, u mu c mu squared. So it implies that narrow energy condition simply says low plus p must be positive. It implies that equation states must be larger than minus unity. Okay. And if we consider the Friedman background, energy momentum conservations equation says that low dot is given by minus three h times low plus p. So it, as long as we consider the expanding universe, which is nothing but H is positive. As long as energy condition and narrow energy condition is satisfied, both must be positive. It implies that low dot must be always negative. This is a result of the narrow energy condition for uh, expanding universe. Okay, please remember that. And if, if we consider the uh, specially flat case, like uh, inflations, this is nothing but the uh, Hubble dot is also positive. Okay. Please keep in mind that. And uh, how robust this is this uh, narrow energy condition for inflation model? Okay. So as a simple example, let's discuss a canonical kinetic term uh, with potential. So uh, for background fields, energy density and the uh, pressure is given by this one. So low plus P is nothing but phi dot square, which is positive. So narrow energy condition is conserved. Okay. But you may wonder that if we extend this uh, kinetic term into the generic form of the uh, action for K inflation, you see, as we I explain, ex explained, then energy density below is given by this one. In some sense, this is nothing but the Hamiltonian density, okay? and the P is K. So apparently, uh, low plus K P equal uh, this one. KX is nothing but, KX is uh, derivative of K with respect to X. Okay? So apparently, it looks that if this KX can be negative, it can violate the narrow energy condition, even within the context of the uh, K inflation. But this is not the case because background is okay, but if we go into the uh, density perturbations, so in order to estimate the uh, uh, density perturbations, uh, we consider the part of the metrics with uh, some commuting gauge and expanding the action up to the second order with respect to lapse, shift, and the curvature perturbations. 
and eliminate alpha and lapse and shift by use of the constraint equa equation. Then finally, you get the uh, uh, quadratic action for uh, curvature perturbation of QZ. And uh, we get uh, this kind of the wave form of the uh, quad action for curvature perturbation. And the point is that, you see, in order to avoid the ghost and the gradient instability for this curvature perturbations, this part and this part must be positive. Okay? So effectively, this is already positive. So it means that this slower parameter epsilon and the sound velocity squared, both must be positive to avoid a ghost and a gradient instability. But this combination, x, kx, appears as a, this epsilon factor. Okay. So, and uh, this denominator is, of course, positive definite. So, imply it means that. If we require this combination is negative to violate null energy conditions, it implies that epsilon must be negative. So we have a ghost of a gradient instability. Okay. So within K inflations, stable violation of null energy condition is impossible. Okay. This is quite a generic feature. And this is, in some sense, quite reasonable. Violation of null energy condition is generically a bit dangerous or strange. Okay. But one may wonder, how about introducing the higher order derivative? Is it still impossible or possible to break null energy condition stably? Okay. And this kind of question can be addressed by a so-called Galileo genesis scenario or uh, our G inflation papers. Now, for simplicity, let's let me introduce the Galion genesis scenario. Uh, this model is based on the, this action, just the Einstein Hilbert action plus some uh, scalar field, but which includes not only first derivative, but also the second derivative. Okay, this is the key point. And the energy momentum tensor for this model can be easily estimated like this one. Okay. And the interesting point is that as a background solutions, this model represents a start from the Minkowski uh, space time in the past. And very interestingly, Hubble parameter increase uh, as the time goes. Okay. As long as the null energy condition is satisfied, uh, HAP dot is always negative for spatially flat universe. So this implies that null energy conditions is violated. And actually, if you, you can verify uh, this, you can directly verify low plus P is negative uh, for this model. So at least background dynamics violates null energy condition. Again, you might wonder if we consider the uh, discuss the consider the uh, perturbations, uh, it might be lead to uh, some instabilities. But very fortunately, in this case, uh, in order to avoid a ghost and a gradient instability, both coefficient must be positive. And actually, in this model, both combination is guaranteed to be positive. So null energy condition is violated stably. Okay. So in this sense, introduction of the higher order derivative is nothing but a mathematical problem. Okay. This introduction opens a new window for the theoretical prediction with a safe violation of the null energy condition. It, in the context of inflation, a blue spectrum index of the gravitation wave can be predicted. Well, if we consider the dark energy models, equation of state W is, can be uh, less than minus unity. So if the observation suggests uh, such features, we have to take into account these higher order derivative terms. Okay. So uh, this is, is a uh, two generic strategy to realize the inflation, which I introduced uh, in this talk. The uh, first one is the pole structure of the kinetic term or the shift symmetry. Okay, 
and the is a key idea to realize inflation. So uh, one may wonder, is there yet another key idea to realize inflation naturally? Uh, young people, yeah, please consider it. I don't have concrete idea. Okay. And uh, uh, let me finally uh, discuss, yeah, uh, how to use inflation. See, it's just a 10 minutes or something. Okay. Anyway, inflation is now strongly supported by observation. So uh, how to use inflation as a tool for something, you see? And uh, this figure is a uh, uh, energy scale of the collider on Earth as a uh, years past. Okay, around uh, 1960 to 20, energy scale of the uh, collider on Earth increased linearly. It's quite nice. Okay, but very unfortunately, recently, its energy is going to saturate. So on the other hand, you see, high energy states, even the Hubble scale, which is much, much, we expect it to be much, much higher than the table scale or even higher, is easily realized in early universe, in particular during inflation. Then why don't you use cosmology or inflation uh, as a collider, alternative to the collider on Earth? In fact, during inflation, uh, many fields are excited. Okay. For example, in the single field inflation models, of course, inflaton uh, is excited, and which is uh, correspond to the uh, curvature perturbation. And we can actually observe such curvature perturbation as a CMB observation, CMB anastropy. You see? And, uh, if we consider the uh, March field models in which uh, uh, there are some many scalar fields whose mass is uh, uh, much smaller than Apple. See? In this case, in addition to the curvature perturbation, adiabatic mode, we have uh, uh, another mode correspond to the isocurvature perturbation. You see, this is the adiabatic mode, which is parallel to the trajectory and the orthogonal part. And if this isocurvature perturbation, which is also excited, during inflation are uh, related to the baryon number or dark matter abundance, you see, uh, such isocarbature perturbation are severely constrained already from Planck satellites. As a typically, roughly speaking, it must be smaller than the 1% in comparison to the uh, curvature perturbation. Okay. So we already get uh, quite useful information for this kind of the excitation during inflation. For example, this con constraint, this uh, constraint uh, gives a stringent uh, restriction of the actual models or something like that. Okay. And up to now, we have mainly paid attention to the path spectrum or two-point correlation functions to identify the inflaton or some isocurvature mode. But we have uh, more information like a uh, uh, higher order correlation functions. So why don't you go into such higher order uh, correlation functions to obtain additional information? Okay. And actually, these higher order correlation functions are quite useful. And uh, we often get uh, uh, quite useful information, so-called uh, soft limit technique, which is often also used in the particle physics cosm uh, community, you see. Uh, soft limit is nothing but uh, to take uh, some zero limit of the one particular moment. Uh, typically speaking, we have uh, two limits. One is in cosmology, thanks to the uh, homogeneity of the background, if we consider the, some uh, uh, connected part of the uh, higher order correlation functions, it's some of the momentum must be uh, closed. Okay, thanks to the uh, homogeneity of the background. So we often use this kind of figure rather than the, this scattering figures. Okay. And the squeeze limit implies that just one momentum should be going to zero. Okay. And uh, for example, if we consider the bispectrum three-point correlation function and the take, take a squeeze limit, it's nothing but uh, a two-point correlation function. And uh, we can get uh, some relationship 
if we take a this squeeze limit, actually, a three point correlation function can be related to the two point correlation function, F which is, this is a famous example given by the uh, Marda Sena. Okay. And another uh, example is so called the collapsed limit. Instead of taking the zero, zero limit of the, this external momentum, we take a, a zero limit of the internal momentum. And in this case, uh, for example, we get uh, some additional information. Okay. And as a typical example of the uh, collapsed limit, we get uh, this kind of the uh, generic relations. For example, if we consider this four point correlation functions and uh, take a squeeze, uh, take a, a collapsed limit, in, take the zero limit of the internal momentum, we get the two three point correlation function information. So this relationship represents a four point correlation function is related to the two information of the three point correlation function. Okay. And uh, by use, I don't go into the details, but by use of the, this uh, relations as a uh, useful tools, we can discriminate uh, source of the perturbation is single field or multiple field. Okay. And finally, we go into the uh, another limit of the squeeze limit. And uh, before going to the another limit, uh, we get uh, uh, we had better uh, remember that there is another interesting class of the inflation. Now we consider the single field models, multi field models. But there is another interesting class of the inflation, so called the quasi single inflation. And this model is characterized by the uh, March field case, but this isocurvature perturbation, uh, whose mass is not uh, very light, instead, it's almost comparable to the Hubble parameter. Okay. In the March field case, one adiabatic mode and another isocarbature mode. But all of them are uh, very small compared to Hubble. But in this quasi single models, one light field, which corresponds to adiabatic mode, but other fields correspond to the uh, relatively heavy field comparable to Hubble. And why we consider this kind of situation? For example, if we go into the supergravity, or if we discuss inflation in the context of supergravity, you see, uh, inflation requires a positive energy density. So such positive energy density uh, manifestly break the uh, supersymmetry. Okay. And such Suji breaking effect is mediated at least by gravity to all of the scalar fields. So almost all scalar fields, unless their masses are protected by some symmetries, receive the some Suji breaking effect, Suji breaking mass, you see. So, Breaking effect is B times the gravity, mediated gravity, G Newton, which is nothing but a Hubble square. Okay. So in the context of supergravity, following a situation naturally happens. There is only one light field whose mass is protected by symmetry like a shift symmetry to realize inflation. But mass, masses of other fields are comparable to the Hubble parameter as a Suji breaking effect, okay? This is the reason why we consider the, this kind of the situation. And actually, even we don't consider the supergravity, if we consider the non-minimal coupling like this one, or just simply introduce a dimension six operator in general, this coupling or operator easily leads to the uh, upper order mass, okay? So why don't you consider this kind of situation? And in fact, these heavy particles inaccessible, inaccessible to collider on us can be excited during inflation. Okay, so time is almost running, so I don't go into the details, but uh, if we go into the squeeze limits, uh, we have uh, some particular feature, uh, different from the single field, multi field, and this quasi single field. Okay. Uh, we have uh, some particular feature for the squeeze limit, like this one. And actually, if the this in the context of quasi-field models, the mass is slightly 
larger than Hapl, we have an oscillatory features. And uh, uh, this is a generic uh, formula uh, for the skewed uh, limit of the presence of the uh, some heavy uh, particle. Okay. And uh, Nomi and uh, Yokoyama and myself show the, uh, this kind of feature in generic. And uh, Arkani Hamid and Marda Sena extended our formula to the arbitrary spin case. Okay. And uh, this spin information is encoded this one. And I don't go into the details, but the interesting point is that, again, depending on the mass, if the mass is slightly larger than Hapl, we have an oscillatory, oscillatory feature uh, for this squeeze limit. Okay. So if we can observe such oscillatory feature in future, which such uh, feature uh, implies the presence of the uh, heavy field during inflation. Okay. And this formula is generic only for the one heavy field. But uh, recently, you see, as I told you before, in general, we can expect uh, not only one field, but also the multiple fields to mass the comparable to Hapl. So with Shuntaro Aoki, he's now a postdoc at the, uh, this CAU group, uh, led by the Professor Hyunmin Dean, you see and uh, discuss uh, uh, some uh, March field effect. And I don't have enough time to go into the detail, but the point is that if we consider the multiple isocarbons, not only we have a high frequency mode, but also the low frequency mode exist. So uh, if the two field masses are very close, this field is very high frequency, but uh, this mode corresponds to the very low frequency. So if we observe uh, squeeze limits and uh, this kind of the modulations, not only high frequency of the mode, but also the some modulation of the low frequency mode, this feature implies that heavy isocarbon is not only single, but also the uh, multiple and whose mass is quite generic. You see, this feature is quite interesting because if we have a two degenerate mass, in case of the collider on us, to disentangle, disentangle this degenerate mass spectrum, we have a very good precision of the energy, energy resolution. On the other hand, in cosmological case, you see this by spectrums, thanks to the degeneracy, we have a, this long wave modulation, which can be easily identified. So let me summarize my talk, you see. As a generic uh, strategy to realize inflation, uh, pole structure of the kinetic term or symmetry like shift symmetry is a very uh, good feature or ideas. So uh, one may wonder, is there yet another key idea to realize inflation naturally? Okay. And also why a pole inflation with order two uh, fits the observational data very well. And the theory with higher derivative order derivatives is nothing, is not only just a mathematical uh, argument, but also can open a new possibility of the prediction of inflation. Okay. And also cosmology, in particular, inflation offers a collider alternative to those on Earth. In fact, many particles, including the heavy particles, can be excited during inflation and can be probed through the prime model perturbations. So we need to prepare the theoretical prediction for, for the future observations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the nice talk. Uh, is there any question? Uh, Kim, please go ahead. Okay. Uh... Hello. Hi, Masahide. Hello. Uh, thank you very much for a nice talk. Uh, okay. Uh, I mean, the, your comment on this pole structure of a kinetic term could be a key idea for the inflation. I'm, I, I, I'm a bit confused because the, uh, you know, uh, it depends. I mean, it rely on some particular way to parameterize the field variables. It seems to me that the, 
I mean, you know, if I state the same thing in the more conventional scalar, in canonical normal scalar field, it seems that assuming this pole structure in the kinetic term in this uh, low field variable descriptions, just it looks like the same as simply assuming that the for the canonically normalized field, you simply assume that your scalar potential is approximately flat over a super Planckian field range. Yeah, in it, some sense, Basically, yeah. I, I don't see a big difference between these two statements, so that the, uh, I don't, I yeah, see, yeah. Uh, I, I, in some sense, I totally agree because just a field definition in some sense. So, yes, yeah. So, the point is that, uh, yeah, you, you rely on the pole structure or you rely on the uh, potentials. Yeah, but it's, it's completely true. assumption, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it's completely true. So, so, so uh, in this sense, I say, you see, uh, if we require directly require the flatness for potential, maybe shift. Symmetry like a shift symmetry is quite useful. Okay. And if we delay, I mean, the, if we uh, pursue the possibility to guarantee the flatness of potential for kinetic term, it means that this pole structure is, in some sense, requirement. Okay, it's fine. But uh, 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 I mean, the, is anybody ever considered, I mean, some potential? Uh, conflict or potential difficulty with the uh, recently proposed uh, swamp land distance conjectures because the that conjecture generically states that the uh, you know uh, you generically have uh, trouble with having uh, you know super flankian field distance in the context of the uh, low energy effect field theory so that that uh, again you know uh, I mean, the same same uh, kind of uh, uh, difficulty may arise for this uh, pole structure, so. Yeah, so uh, I, I don't know uh, who ever discussed this feature in, in the context of Swampland, but uh, for example, originally this model is proposed in, in the context of supergravity. So for example, if- You mean pole, pole is, inflation uh, or the- uh, Yeah, pole inflation, yeah, pole, pole inflation. inflation. Alpha or conformal attractor models. Mm -hmm. And uh, for example, you see this kind of uh, pole structure appears if we take a Kera potential as a log type. That's true. Yeah, but but uh, usually in that case, the uh, we of course it, it's in, I mean it, it, it may not be proven, but uh, somehow I would implicitly assume that okay, this form of color potential is sensible approximation only for large field range, not <laughs> around the low equals small, but around the low equals large. That's, for instance, that's the, what, that's the experience we have from string theory, for instance. I see, yeah. So, so uh, at least my position is more, how to say, effective theory point, viewpoint. Okay. <laughs> you see, from the bottom-up approach. So okay. just, good, just good. saying that, uh, you see, as long as this model fits the observation, observation very well, mm -hmm. then uh, I just expect uh, something behind this fact. Yeah, I about that I agree with you. But uh, you know the reason that uh, I raise up some uh, concern here is that somehow I thought that you try to provide some motivation for some more fundamental reason, you know, uh, fundamental theoretical reason mm -hmm. why this mm -hmm. this particular structure in your effective theory, you know, is interesting or may have some chance to be uh, derivable from uh, more fundamental theories. Mm -hmm. In this yeah, sense. So, 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 so in this sense, if uh, I'm not sure, but uh, if observations really support this kind of features, then swamp land conjecture might be modified. You see, this is my position. <laughs> this no, is but, my position. But, 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 observation is observation, you see. Be, okay. Because <laughs> I, I don't say much here, but uh, I had a very bad memory because before double map result would be was released, Many string theorists told me, at least directly told me that. I, we never believe in creation because in the context of super string, Doshita vacuum is never realized at that time, at least. You see, but once WMAP result is appears, WMAP result appears and the uh, inflation is believed by many people. So string theory people 
invented the Doshita vacuum. You see? So, so in my position, I respect the observations first. Oh, that's absolutely true. I mean, you have PhD yeah, so that yeah, the, yeah. Uh, you know, the, the most important yeah. criteria so, is the observation. Yeah. So, so oh, of course, uh, swampland conjecture or idea is quite interesting, but uh, I don't say because of such conjecture, uh, this model doesn't work. No, no, Masaida, maybe, okay, you misunderstood my point. You okay, know, okay, I'm please, not, please tell me. Uh, I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to be against inflation based on this stupid something conjecture. I'm, mm -hmm. I, I'm raising a concern is that, you know, your, your, I mean, the, your approach, right, for, for, the, uh, for the theory of inflation, I mean, you, mm -hmm. you, you emphasize two possibilities, right? Pole inflation and uh, shift symmetry, mm. and that, uh, but you know that that could be. I mean, inflation is, you know, has a quite uh, you know reliable observational evidence. Mm. That's absolutely true. I absolutely agree with you. But uh, you know, your discussion, you know, I mean, pointing some, uh, I mean, you know, proposing some, you know, some, I mean, plausible approach. You know, towards the underlying theory of inflation, uh, then you know, for that questions, I mean, the we can uh, consult from the uh, string sample conjectures at least theoretically. That's my point. Yes. Okay. I mean, you know, I, I, I accept the inflation absolutely, but uh, you know, you know, this uh, pole inflation, uh, I don't know, but you know. <laughs> okay. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Just, just so my my message just. Uh, uh, as an effective theory, if we introduce this idea, this fits the observation to very well. I, I don't say you see, swamp lab conjecture is wrong or something. Mm -hmm. Just and so yeah, the yeah, probably yeah, this feature is not well fit the uh, yeah, it's not well fitted to the swamp lab conjecture. So probably we need to modify this idea or something. Yeah, okay. I think the uh, Maybe it's better on. to discuss later. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, moving on to the next speaker, uh, because yeah. Yeah, coming on. But I also Sorry, have yeah. some questions, probably so also from other people. But uh, uh, what do you think? <laughs> Good. Uh, timing time is up, so uh, we should move to the next. Uh, yeah. Talk. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the interesting discussion. Um, okay. Yeah. But during the coffee break, maybe we can have more discussion. Okay. Yeah, oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. So, Jin Ok, uh, are you there? So, can you see okay. my screen? Yeah, I can see this slide. Okay. Uh, where is it? Okay, so first okay. of all, it is my great pleasure to talk at um, CAO workshop again. I thank Hyun Min for inviting me again for this nice meeting. So, okay, yes, so already. Just wait, Jin Ok, wait. Before, yes. before Shinto uh, introduce you. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, just let me briefly introduce you. Uh, the next speaker is Jin Ok Gong from Ewa Women's University. Uh, the title is shown here, uh, so please start again. Okay, so let me just begin again. So it is my great pleasure to be able to talk at the Chungang University PSM workshop again, and I thank Hyunmin for inviting me again. So already Masahide gave very nice introduction about the overall picture of inflation and how we conceive it. So let me just uh, narrow down the scope and let me just be a bit more specific about a certain model of inflation and what we can run something new. Um, so the topic of my presentation is hybrid inflation and effective theory approach. So this work is um, on the progress. I hope uh, it will be finished quite soon with my postdoc Maria Milova who did a very great job um, in all the way. So this is the outline of my presentation. I'll be very quick about introduction, why in inflation is interesting, etc. And let me just directly dive into the main to topic, um, how we can construct the effective theory of hybrid inflation and what we can learn from it. 
And then let me just show you what is the effects of quantum corrections, which were not properly um, regarded previously. And then let me conclude. So let me just first begin with why we are interested in inflation. Well, probably I don't have to say too much about that. We have a bunch of otherwise finely tuned initial conditions as observed from the cosmic microwave background. Basically, the cosmic microwave background is extremely homogeneous and isotropic beyond the causal communication range at the time. So that is called horizon problem. Why is the CMB so much homogeneous? And we have some similar problems like flatness problems, monopole problems, and, and on top of that, um, what is the origin of the 10 to the minus five degree of temperature fluctuations in the CMB? So, if we do not resort to inflation, we have no idea how to impose those finely tuned initial conditions. That is the universe at the generation of the CMB was composed of um, roughly 10 to the four or 10 to the five causally disconnected patches, which absolutely have no reason why they should have uh, the same temperature with the degree of 10 to the minus five. So inflation is a um, dynamical mechanism to provide those initial conditions. Why is the CMB so much homogeneous? Well, because the whole observable universe has started from a single causally connected patch. So it is not surprising at all why the observed universe has the same temperature. Why is the universe so much close to flat? because the universe has expanded so much during inflation so that we only see locally flat region. And where are monopoles? Well, they are all diluted away during the vast um, expansion during inflation. And what is the origin of initial perturbation? As we, as we can see from the uh, temperature and isotropies of the CMB, they are coming from the quantum fluctuations on the very early universe. So fortunately or unfortunately, the predictions of inflation, like for example, the 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 um the the, the um tilt of the two-point correlation function and statistical property of the, the, the uh, primordial perturbations as terrestrial, they are well consistent with the most recent observations, including the Planck satellite. So um other competing theories previously uh, with inflation, for example, the cosmic defects like cosmic strings as the origin of cosmic structure were ruled out because they are inconsistent with observations. So at the moment, we accept inflation to be the canonical model of very early universe before the onset of hot Big Bang evolution. So then why am I going to talk about effective theory? Well, at least in the context of inflation, one reason is because the energy scale of inflation as is indicated by the unobservation of the tensor mode, so um, the tensor mode of amplitude 0.01 in terms of a tensor to scalar ratio roughly corresponds to the energy scale of inflation, something like 10 to the 15 GeV or something like that. And we have not observed the tensor to, to scalar. We have not yet observed the tensor spectrum. So that means the energy scale of inflation is not beyond 10 to the 15 GeV or something like that. It should be smaller than that. But nevertheless, this is far greater, order of magnitude greater than any terrestrial um, particle accelerators can reach. For example, the most recent, the biggest and largest particle collider, the LHC, is the energy scale of LHC is 14 TeV or something like that. So this is 10 to the 12 order of magnitude smaller than the energy scale of inflation. So we have no idea if our extending the, the, the current understanding of the quantum field theory based on standard model can be valid up to such a vast, huge energy scale or not. And on top of that, the only three numbers at the moment to match for any inflation model to be acceptable are first, the amplitude of the, the observed power spectrum and the tilt of the power spectrum and the magnitude of the tensor for perturbation. Well, on top of that, you may talk about um, the degree of Gaussianity, 
then we have four numbers. Anyway, only we have four numbers to match. And there are literally hundreds of acceptable inflation models in the market, which all matches those four numbers. So we have no idea which model is better than the others or what is the very inflation that really occurred if ever happened in the very early universe. So we need to first some way of manage our ignorant, ignorance on very high energy scale and also a tool that can deal with different inflation models in a in wider perspective. So in this context, the universality of effective theory is very powerful. And finally, why hybrid inflation? Am I going to talk about hybrid inflation? Well, first, it is relatively easily realizable in um, high energy physics. For, for example, um, in the context of supersymmetry or supergravity, hybrid inflation is relatively easy to, provide, to construct. For example, if you want to construct some um, very naive models like M square or M square phi square model, the simplest one, then you have to invent, you have to um, provide some way why the influx mass is so much light against any red, red, radiative corrections or um, those kind of quantum contributions. And on top and further, um, with relatively small number of parameters, hybrid inflation has very rich structure and it can lead to further very interesting phenomenology after inflation. And also it has connections with particle physics, for example, as you use very soon, some critical moment in hybrid inflation is so-called waterfall phase transition. And you can um, connect the moment of a waterfall phase transition to some phase transition in particle physics, so like a gut phase transition or electroweak phase transition or something like that. So it has a very interesting um, relationship with particle physics. So that's why um, hybrid inflation has attracted a lot of interest in the community. So that is the motivation why the three words, inflation and effective theory and hybrid inflation. So I am going to talk about the effective theory of, especially in the context of a waterfall, um, what we can run something new with that we have not um, considered properly. So let me just dive into the main idea about the, um, the story. So, well, have, have, having said that effective theory is a very important and powerful tool, let me just talk a little bit more about the effective field theory in the context of inflation. So effective theory is such a powerful tool and we can also consider effective field theory of inflation. And as usual, as we accept, we can construct some effective field theory, say that the cutoff scale around lambda or something like that, then we can approach effective theory in two different directions. One is the conventional one. That is, um, we just collect all the operators consistent with a lot of symmetric principles. For example, during inflation, we know that um, the, because of the expansion of the universe, the time translation of symmetry is broken, but still the spatial section enjoys um, homogeneity and isotropy. So the spatial deformism should be preserved. So you can, con you can collect all the operators that breaks time translations, but keeps the, the spatial dimorphism. So this is the famous theory of um, effective field theory of inflation by Chung and com company in 2008. Or if you have the luxury of having some model theory from which you can derive inflation, well, you can integrate out some too heavy degrees of freedom that is not very much relevant for some energy scale of inflation, which should, which should be um, significantly lower than the, um, the, the, the energy scale of mother theory. Then you can integrate those heavy degrees of freedom and you can have the effective theory that is relevant for the energy scale of inflation. This was worked um, by my collaborators and also my, myself. So, what we are going to adopt here in the context of um, hybrid inflation is that because we have the um, 
action of hy hybrid inflation, and we are interested in what is the dynamical effect of the data waterfall field, we adopt the top-down approach. That is, as you will see in the next slide, we will integrate out the heavy degree of freedom. That is the fluctuation of the waterfall fields, and we will see what is the effects of those quantum fluctuations of the waterfall field. You know, so, can I ask a question? Oh, yes, please. Yeah, so in practice, what uh, would be the best cutoff scale you are thinking of? Well, it depends, it depends. Well, because this is, you see, lambda here mm -hmm. is based on the energy scale of inflation, which is we are totally ignorant. So in fact, it depends on your taste or your choice. What is the energy scale of inflation you are thinking of? It may be say, got energy scale, or it may be say, um, so you are thinking of extremely low scale inflation, could be as low as say some TV scale or something like that. So it really depends. It really so is. Can so I take it um, uh, as the scale de determined by the height of the potential, for instance. Mm -hmm. so oh, yes. In, usually, that 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 would be one very good guideline. Okay. Be, be, because the um, in many cases the height of the potential is the driving force of inflation. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. So to talk about hybrid inflation, let me just remind you of hybrid how hybrid inflation proceeds. So. The um, roughly horizontal line is the time direction, or if we assume that the evolution of inflaton field is monotonic, it, it is along with the direction of inflaton. So very, very early on, inflation was occurring, right? So inflation is occurring, and the direction orthogonal to the um, in flatten direction is so-called waterfall field, which whose effective mass squared depends on the in flatten field, as I will show you later. So at very early times, the waterfall field gains very heavy positive mass squared. So the potential along the, the waterfall direction is, as you can see here, it is very steeply positive. So the in flatten or the field, the field is well anchored at the uh, minimum of the waterfall direction. So inflation is occurring. It keeps still going on, but the effective mass squared of the waterfall field, which is a function of inflaton, is now decreasing. So as you can see here, the effective mass squared of the waterfall decreased so that the, the, the curvature of the waterfall direction is gets smaller. And at some point, at some point, the waterfall direction becomes completely flat. It, the waterfall um, field gains momentarily completely massless. And this is the moment we call waterfall phase transition. So after this critical point, the waterfall gains um, some force vacuum he here and there. And the standard picture is that very soon, the waterfall field gains very heavy mass squared and negative heavy mass squared. So it is tachyonically instable and it rolls quickly to one of its um, true vacuum. So inflation ends almost instant instantaneously as soon as the inflaton field reaches the, the, the critical point or the, um, the field value for waterfall phase transition. So, this is the standard picture of how hybrid inflation proceeds. So in terms of the effective mass squared of the waterfall field, we can roughly divide the, the, the period of inflation in three different regimes. So one is well before the waterfall phase transition. So in this case, the effective mass squared of the waterfall field is positive definite. So the waterfall field is well trapped at zero. It is not moving. Right, And when the inflaton field is at the critical value, then exactly the waterfall field mass is vanishing. So all waterfall phase transition occurs. So in this case, the waterfall field gains very, relatively very large um, quantum fluctuations, left, roughly speaking, left or right. 
So it can leave the otherwise unstable um, equilibrium point um, zero, and it can roll one of the two minima. So when they, the inflaton, inflaton field is smaller than the critical value, then the effective mass squared of the waterfall field is negative. So it is tachyonic. So it is very unstable. So it can roll down to one of the, the minima. Um, uh, am I have five minutes or 15 minutes? Uh, 15 minutes, including this. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. But nevertheless, let me just proceed a bit quickly so that you can enjoy a long coffee break. So accordingly, we can divide the different regimes for effective theories. So one is the positive mass regime, where the waterfall field is heavy, basically. So we can safely integrate out the waterfall field, and the result is very standard Coleman Weinberg type um, um, potential. So this is something already very well known. And in fact, this is now kind of um, textbook example. You can, you can compute yourself or you can ask any of your students to compute it and he or she will bring you the answer in a couple of days. If, they have, if you have educated quantum field theory with very thin theory. And for the vanishing case, then you can, you can easily guess that if you, once you get the Coleman Weinberg type potential, you will get the logarithm, logarithmic correction. And when the effective mass is exactly zero at the moment of waterfall phase transition, the logarithm simply diverges. So in this case, well, this never means you have done something wrong, but you have to adopt some different techniques to uh, tame the divergence. For, for example, using the resummation of the, the, the canon Zimanzig equation. So this is another very uh, standard textbook uh, procedure. For example, you can find in the, the, the textbook of Peskin and Schroeder on quantum field theory. And also, this is also can be uh, done very easily. So what about the case the effective mass squared is negative, so that multiple phase transition is occurring. Then the standard answer you can find from the, the, the um, quantum field theory textbook um, for, symmetry, for spontaneous symmetry breaking is that the sole effect of the, the, the integrating out the, the quantum fluctuation is just a shift of the background when the, the effective the potential is minimized. So is this the answer? Well, let me just show you then. It is something in fact you can easily proceed. The steps you, you should take to obtain the one loop cracked effective potential is very much a standard. That is, you start with two field potential. So this is the um, potential for the inflaton and waterfall field. And for the inflaton potential, I, let me just take the simplest possibility, the m squared by square potential. And I just adopt the standard type of um, interaction between the waterfall and inflaton field. And the waterfall field potential is of the symmetry, symmetry breaking type. So the procedure is very standard. You just expand the waterfall field to be a summation sum of um, classical background and quantum fluctuation. Of course, the, the, the classical field value is the uh, vacuum expectation value of the whole field. And you simply integrate over the quantum fluctuation. So the reason why we are doing here is that during the waterfall phase transition, the waterfall is dynamical. So in this case, you cannot simply integrate out the waterfall as a whole, which you can do for the, the, the um, positive mass squared case. In this case, the background value itself is the same, in fact, as the quantum fluctuation. So you can integrate out the whole waterfall contribution. But for the case of um, waterfall case, the background field value is of the, the waterfall is dynamical. So in, in this case, you cannot integrate out the, the waterfall as a whole, but what you can do is integrate out the quantum fluctuation of the waterfall field. And of course, as a result, you will face um, spurious divergences, which you can cancel out using uh, uh, um, um, counter terms and appropriately choosing the, the um, renormalization scale, something like that. And the final answer of the one-loop corrected potential is 
given like this. So the first two terms, right? These two terms are very standard terms. This is the effective mass squared. And because we are interested in the um, waterfall phase, the bare mass squared, this term, is negative. So that's why we put the absolute values um, sign here. And of course, uh, the quotic term. And we have the logarithmic correction. So in fact, this is something you may have expected. We get, as a result of effective theory, we get some lower rhythmic correction, right? And of course here, lambda is some arbitrary renormalization scale. But what is quite interesting here is that the validity of this potential is as long as this logarithmic correction is under control, it, is, it remains small. That is up to this point. Up to this point, the logarithm remains small and we can believe our perturbation theory. That is the theory described by this one loop corrected potential. But what we know is that the vacuum expectation value of the, uh, sorry, here I'd better write not vacuum expectation value, but the minimum. The classical minimum of the waterfall field is at this value, which is larger than the point where the effective theory becomes, um, sorry, the logarithm becomes uh, divergent, right? So at some point, the sign flips well before the minimum of the waterfall field is reached. So that means at some point, the argument of logarithm is flipped in such a way that, in such a way that the effective potential becomes imaginary, right? So of course you may find it is extremely uneasy to have imaginary potential, but you should accept it as a result of one loop correction. We are not summing over all the possible corrections of the, the, the quantum fluctuations, but we have just cut off our theory at the quadrat level that is the one level of quantum fluctuation of the waterfall field. And the, the, the remnant of one loop corrected potential is this imaginary part of the effective, the effective potential. And in fact, you can interpret the effective, the, the imaginary part of the potential as, is related to vacuum decay rate, which is um, uh, quite a long time, some decades ago, pointed up by Eric Weinberg and Wu. So we can trust the one loop corrected effective potential as long as the imaginary part remains small. That is for the small until we, from the top of the potential until we get close to this point. So in fact, this is quite reasonable. What we are doing is we are basically considering very close to the moment of a waterfall phase transition. And we are trying to describe, describe the effective theory while the field is rolling a bit away from this minimum up to some point where the effective theory becomes no more um, uh, 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 valid, right? So, let me just add one more thing too, before I just show you the, the, the result, the effects of the quantum corrections. So the standard rule is that we expect a slow inflation is proceeding until we meet the critical point. And after then, the field quickly rolls to true minimum and the inflation ends almost instantaneously. This is the, what we conceive. So what we can naively expect is that up to this waterfall phase transition and well, probably slightly right immediately after the waterfall phase transition, still slow roll inflation is going on, right? So if we use our effective potential to compute and imposing the slow roll um, conditions to compute the velocity of the inflation field, well, this is, we have to be a bit careful here. So this is the result of the, the solving the effective, using the effective potential and slow roll conditions to write down the 
in velocity of the inflow term field in terms of the, um, the field values. And you can see, what you can see is that the first two terms of the later two terms of the real part is further suppressed by the imaginary part, right? So this means the first term here, right? This is the term purely coming from the inflaton potential should be compensating the difference between the two subdominant real part and imaginary part, because we want some, um, what should I say, kind of a healthy initial condition in, in the context of a slow roll inflation, right? So this can be translated into the bound on the coupling between inflaton and waterfall. That is, the coupling should be smaller than certain value. Uh, well, of course, if you naively impose the real part should be smaller, uh, should be greater than the imaginary part, then you get some different um, um, constraints between the mass and the coupling. But um, this is in fact weaker. So that's why we have adopted some different initial con different conditions for the, 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 the um, coupling. So these, this will be our important constraint to guarantee the, the, the analytic control on the initial conditions. So let's just see what's happening. So let me just first show you um, some boring effect, relatively boring effect. That is slow roll inflation proceed even after waterfall phase transition. So this is in fact already um, somewhat counter, into, counter to the standard rule because the standard rule is such that after waterfall phase the transition immediately inflation ends. But in fact, this possibility was pointed out um, almost now decades ago by Classe and Kodama and company. And as you can see here, the, the, the waterfall field, so waterfall phase transition occurs at some moment and still the slower parameter here, as you can see, remains very small, right? until some moment. And in this case, as you can see here, because the effective potential is, contains imaginary part, if you solve the equations of motion of the waterfall field and um, inflaton field, they gain imaginary part. So if those imaginary part kicks in and becomes dominant, you can say that uh -huh, beyond this point, we are entering the regime of the, the, the invalid regime of effective potential and quantum effects becomes more becomes more dominant than classical evolution effect. But in this case, as, as you can see here, the imaginary part remains always very, very smaller, much smaller than the real part. So you can say, safely say that in this case, there's no significant effects at all by integrating out the quantum um, fluctuations of the waterfall field. So how about then the standard um, picture where inflation ends almost instantaneously as soon as we cross the waterfall phase transition, right? So let me just adopt the parameter set given by the Linde's original paper in 1994. That is the, with these parameter values, this corresponds to, I remember, um, the waterfall phase transition is related to um, electroweak phase transition. So in this case, if we do not take into account the quantum corrections, that is, we are just satisfied with the classical potential, then this is what exactly happens in the standard picture, right? So as soon as the waterfall phase transition occurs, inflation ends almost in instantaneously. And the inflaton field is oscillating in the minimum. And also the waterfall field is oscillating one of its minima, right? This is the standard picture and okay, very, very good. But if you take into the quantum corrections, the story is completely different. So for example, if you can, you see the real part of the inflaton field, then it goes up, it blows up, right? And this is already obvious if you take a look at the velocity of the inflaton field. From the beginning, the imaginary part of the inflaton field velocity is dominating 
on top of the real part. So in this case, the inflaton field is turning around and it just, the, the, it just um, goes back. So of course, this means we cannot believe these parameter sets to, con to consider what's happening based on the classical argument, but quantum effects are dominating from the beginning of the uh, uh, waterfall phase transition. And of course, you can try some different parameter sets. In this case, I remember this corresponds to um, the waterfall phase transition being gut phase transition, 10 to the 15 GV or something like that. But the story goes more or less the same. Still, the quantum effects dominate from the beginning and we obtain more or less similar behavior. That is, um, we have some nonsense behavior of the inflaton field. So if we are to impose a slow initial conditions and guarantee that the um, classical evolution is dominating and the imaginary part, that is the quantum back reaction um, is subdominant, we have to impose very small coupling between waterfall and uh, uh, inflaton. But in this case, the phase transition occurs on super Planckian skies, uh, on super Planckian scale. And in this case, well, you can easily guess that the inflaton is moving very slowly along the um, valley. And there's a flip of the inflat flip along the, the, the waterfall direction. And the field is falling one of the two valleys and still along that those new valleys, slow inflation is proceeding. So in this case, this is something similar to um, what's happening in the uh, um, slow inflation case, even after water phase transition. And in terms of quantum effect, this is not very much interesting. So what we can see is that the quantum correction is essentially important to properly um, address if inflation is end and we are entering the um, non-perturbative regime where quantum effects are important or still inflation is going on. So to conclude, effective theory is a very powerful tool and for inflation also it's very powerful. And for hybrid inflation, depending on regimes we are considering, we can construct different effective theories. And what we have considered is the effective theory of waterfall in hybrid inflation. And what is very important here is that classical consideration on what's happening after waterfall phase transition is never enough. And taking into account the effects of quantum, correct, quantum corrections is very important. So let me just stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for nice talk. Uh, is there any question or comment? I have a question on the imaginary part of the inflaton uh, due to loop corrections. Uh, so I, I mean, is it correct interpretation of the, your result? I mean, instead of uh, introducing imaginary part of the field, can you say that the maybe imaginary part of time uh, has to do that has to do with the quantum tunneling? The I mean imaginary part. I don't know if you can describe the loop corrections mm -hmm. uh, in the imaginary part of the effective potential. I don't know if you interpret it as the real time uh, dynamics. Well. Of course, you, in, in the way of obtaining the um, effective potential when you are performing the uh, path integral, and of course, usually as, as you can, as you know, you convert to Euclidean time and you perform the integral. So that is the only part um, you can introduce as far as I understand, uh, imaginary part of a tunnel. So uh, maybe, I mean, wait, so can you show us the equation motion for phi dot? So if, when you have a phi dot, you mm -hmm. have uh, some initial value, initial mm -hmm. condition plus some corrections and then those corrections. So, so basically okay. these, these terms are coming from the imaginary part of the potential. Yes. So 
maybe then uh, I don't know if the imaginary part becomes important, then mm -hmm. uh, instead of real time, you may mm -hmm. have to introduce ima imaginary, imaginary time. Then maybe uh, instead of Euclid, um, instead of uh, usual action, mm -hmm. you may have to consider Euclidean action for the quantum quantum tunneling. And if the quantum tunneling is not important, it's not that important. Maybe just to mm -hmm. the classical trajectory, mm -hmm. uh, just so, you, so you, to follow the so, classical trajectory or not. So, so you mean just a treating as a whole, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, that's that's in fact something I did not consider. Okay, um, let me just think about that very seriously. Well, in that in the case, if we what if we consider as a whole the imaginary time? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much for pointing out that. We don't have much time. Only short question, Masahide. Please go on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure this is short, but uh, yeah, related to human question, yeah. Uh, what do you mean by quantum correction after inflation and the uh, uh, field is background field is mm -hmm. rapidly changing? Mm -hmm, and, uh, mm -hmm. what, what kind of vacuum or quantum correction do you evaluate? So, what we are doing here is integrating over the quantum fluctuations of the, of the, the, the um, water field. So, you can Put in put um, the decomposition of the waterfall field into the background and the quantum fluctuation, right? Well, why why don't you consider mm -hmm. quantum fluctuation chi itself? Why chi itself? Well, in fact, that, that's that's a very interesting question. So one thing is because um, we are following the standard procedure that, it, 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 as you can see from textbooks, that is you just assume some classical background and quantum fluctuation around that and you integrate out the, the, the quantum fluctuation. So but, that but, is, yeah. But do you say quantum effect is dominant then even chi note cannot be regarded as classical? So in that, so once the quantum effect is dominant, so in this case, when the, the, the imaginary part becomes more important then of course you cannot do that. Of course, you cannot do that. But say that, well, uh, what should I say? Yeah. So in fact, oh, <laughs> uh, let, let me just let me just ignore that um, telephone. I know that in seconds. You know. You know. Okay. All right. Uh, I mean, All right. I, I just that you. Are Sorry for that dis dis disruption. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's better to discuss later in the yeah, yeah, yeah. next session. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah, I, I will be that. here, so okay. I am very <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> I, I, I saw other person raising a hand, but maybe you can uh, discuss during the uh, coffee break. So uh, we should go to the next uh, talk. Uh, Kim, please share your screen. Oh, uh, can I? Can I? The, oh, okay. Actually, this is the. I mean, the related to the Maasai questions. I guess that the, uh, you know, Zinuk, uh, Zinuk's approach uh, at the starting point presumes that, the, I mean, you are interested in the, uh, I mean, the uh, sort of dynamics. Uh, when the, uh, this water field chi is settled down uh, at one of the local minimum after this water page, well after, the, you know, well after the uh, water page transition. So, I mean, all in that case, I mean, you decompose this field chi around, you know, the chi zero, that's the, uh, you know, the local minimum value and uh, its fluctuation. And then if you follow the standard approach, then the, the result shows the, uh, I mean, the only reveals the physics in the field range near the, uh, uh, the, the, near the chi zero. But on the other hand, somehow, you try to extrapolate your result to the regime around the waterfall page transition. I mean, the around when, well before the, your chi field is settled down at chi zero. So I guess the, I'm not sure if uh, this approach can give any meaningful, uh, you know, can give any meaningful physics uh, 
uh, when the uh, um, before when before the your Kai field settled down at Kai Zero. Uh, sorry, so it was different question from Masahide, right? I, I guess it's related. Okay. So, I mean, so uh, my point is that the your approach is basically you decompose your chi field around chi zero. So that that means that you are basically interested in the uh, physics near chi zero when the uh, your field chi is around chi zero. But on the other hand, now then you know in your discussion you extrapolate your result to the regime when the you know chi is about zero, right? I mean not not around chi zero. Mm -hmm. So yes, in, in that case, basically we are starting a little bit away from the uh, phase transition. So our starting point is not here. If, if it's just a little away, away, then maybe as Masaida mm -hmm. suggested, mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 the correct way may be just uh, you integrate the, the fluctuation of chi set, not oh, yeah, the I fluctuation understand. around chi zero. Yes, I understand. And what we have checked is that we computed the quantum corrected um, initial value. So we, we, gave, we give some initial value of chi zero, which should be roughly speaking of order the Hubble parameter, right? This is, that's very reasonable, right? Mm -hmm. And we followed what, what is the evolution of the background after integrating of the quantum, quantum fluctuations, say quantum fluctuations. And we have checked that it is consistent with completely integrating out the com complete, not considering the background, but only considering the quantum fluctuations and integrating over the, the K space. So we have checked they are consistent until our perturbative theory say that up to this point, it is broken. They are consistent. They are all very, they are in very good agreement. So that means our effective theory approach is very, very valid up to this point until our theory is no more valid. That's okay. Uh, maybe uh, I, 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 I don't Sorry, really understand your approach. No. Okay, maybe you can talk later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Let's go to the next uh, talk. Okay, so uh, are you ready? Okay. Yeah, uh, so okay. Next speaker is uh, uh, Kiyun Choi. Uh, the title is uh, Reconstructing Inflationary Potential from a Power Spectrum Using a Generalized Sort of Inflation. So please start. Yeah, thank you for the introduction and the organization of this workshop. Yeah, as the title says, uh, I introduce some more general way to reconstruct inflationary potential from a given power spectrum. Um, well, Masai and the Chinu explained much about inflation. As uh, they said, our you now the strategy is that first assume some inflationary potential, which came from some uh, theoretic, some given theory or something, or as uh, some toy model, and assume potential and calculate solve the differential equation to find the uh, curvature perturbation and the super range scale and also this power spectrum from this one and then calculate the CMB and isotropy and the IG scale structures and compare with the observations. So anyway, this is uh, from observations, people uh, constructed a simple model, this power law, power spectrum and the many people tried to make inflation and potential, which can give that the proper uh, power spectrum. But here, our study is that not assuming the potential, but from this uh, power spectrum is given from data, that when the, this power spectrum is given, we wanna uh, to find the direct way to find the potential from power spectrum. Actually, that's the inverse way. Um, well, anyway, our study is not the most general one, just we suggest uh, some 
one special way with uh, some conditions, for example, some single infla single scalar infla inflaton field and some canonical kinetic terms. And with those conditions, we can uh, introduce this way to find the potential. That's the summary. Okay. Uh, well, okay. Anyway, the simplest shape of power spectrum is assumed this kind of power law form with uh, this uh, amplitude and the spectral index at some pivot scale k star. And when this form is assumed, and uh, it, this form is uh, uh, has fitting with the data and gives uh, this uh, amplitude and the spectral index that's given, and the people try to. Uh, find the inflation potential, which can predict where this uh, NS and also with the spectrum to scalar ratios. But that is just the simplest assumption. Power law form is the simplest assumption, even though it is it fits very well. But there could be some deviations from power law. But actually, this plug paper and the inflation they tried to study the deviations with uh, many model independent way. So one is this kind of uh, power law form times exponential fk, and this fk can may have this kind of uh, oscillatory features, but still the error bar is uh, large, so they find no significant evidence. Or well, also another way, some called the cubic explain method, they also find some this kind of many different possible power spectrum with the mean is a red lines, but Still, this is uh, somewhat consistent with the power law. Not much devi have deviations. Well, in other way, this kind of small oscillatory feature still can uh, explain the same B data very well. Well, it can be said still. Mm. But anyway, what, what our, my, my study is that, anyway, when the power spectrum is given, well, it could be this kind of power law form, or it it could have some small oscillatory features. From these features or power spectrum, we want to construct potential directly. There was a study in the 1990s that uh, this kind of biologists and supplementals, and also after that, since uh, this Grishuk or Copland et al. they studied uh, with the we see the standard slower or assumptions. Standard slower means. I will explain later, but anyway, in their way, it's uh, simple. First, they assume this relation. Power spectrum is related to the Hubble scale squared divided by this slower parameter, epsilon h. Epsilon h is divide, defined by this, which is usual way. So this formula is only valid in the standard slower approximation, which means that when this slower parameter is small, smaller than, much smaller than one, and also this epsilon is almost a constant, which means that, that the next order slow parameter is much smaller than epsilon. Under that assumption, this relation is true. Anyway, with these relations, they connect and into slow approximation, this time derivative can be connected to the change of the co-moving uh, number, this k at the value and the horizon exit in the slower approximation. Then this epsilon can be written as a derivative of h about local k. Then this relation is simply the differential equations about h about h about k and is related to the power spectrum. So we assume that this power spectrum is given at uh, some given k. k can be some this simple scales from data. Then we can integrate this relation and find the h in terms of k by integrating this power one of power spectrum. Actually, here h star is uh, an uh, integration constant and it cannot be determined from this uh, scalar power spectrum. So this is a uh, one uh, constant. But actually, if we observe some tensor power spectrum at given uh, scale, then h star can be determined at the scales. Then that completes this uh, uh, h. But anyway, with this scalar power spectrum, it is still undetermined. Anyway, H of in terms of K can be determined this way. And also this is a potential, scalar potential, I mean, but scalar potential in terms of K, this co-moving wave number 
Cos can be determined from these relations. This comes from Hubble equation, a Friedman equation, is a potential and phi dot square, but in single scalar field models, canonical, then phi dot is related to H dot. So in this way, we can change this phi dot square using this H dot, the epsilon H and the power spectrum. Therefore, given a, using this H in terms of K, function K H, we can write U in terms of K. The second and third one is the phi. Anyway, we have this relation H dot phi dot. We know H in terms of K. Therefore, also we can find the phi in terms of K by integrating this uh, function of H's. That gives phi K. Now we know phi K and the UK, then by eliminating K, then you can find the U phi. So that's the way to reconstruct the potential from the power spectrum. But here, assume that this is a slower, yes, standard slower relations. So that was done in 20 years ago. Well, one example is that well, they showed some examples, but for this power, this power spectrum, uh, scale the power spectrum for this deep type, then using the previous method, they found the potentials, but different uh, potentials for different integration constant. They return this V0, but it's related to H star. So this kind of potential, this phi minus phi zero V over normalized by V0, also can give this deep power spectrum, or this kind of uh, potential also can give this deep power spectrum. So even though the potential shape is different, they can give the same power spectrum for the corresponding scales. But that is due to this undetermined constant anyway. But there's a limitation in this uh, method because the first, this assumed the relation is only true for standard slower, which means that the slower parameter is small and this should be almost constant, nearly constant. So the next of the slower parameter should be much smaller than this one. Which means that if the power spectrum is uh, almost uh, yeah, this uh, power of form, then it's good. But if power spectrum has a kind of oscillatory features, then during oscillation, the next order parameter, slower parameter cannot be smaller than the first order slower parameter. So oscillating power spectrum, this method cannot be used. So it's a limitation. But here we want to introduce the new way, some more generalized way that can be used to this kind of oscillating power spectrum. So for this one, we use this generalized slower approximation that was studied actually 2002 by Stuart and Dodelson. The main point is that they changed this uh, equation of curvature perturbation into some different way. This uh, different way means that this left-hand side is uh, equation for scale invariant equation. I mean that right-hand side is zero, then this left-hand side gives a uh, exact scale invariant power spectrum, which means that this right-hand side can be understood as the deviation from the scale invariant uh, spectrum. So here, if a G function is defined by this F double prime minus F prime over F, but F is related to the background values, uh, A scale factor and phi scalar field time derivative H and psi. Psi is a, is a conformal time, the minus sign. So when, what main point is that when G is small, lower than one, then we can treat this right-hand side as a perturbation. So that's the main point of this paper. Then the relation is that the power spectrum of log can be calculated from the given F functions. F is a background uh, values and F prime over F and uh, plus some the G squared order. So, so when G is small, here G is small, G is small, small G is assumed. So first order of G, this power spectrum is related to this F background values. So this power, this relation can be used for some potential with the, which have uh, this kind of features. But another one is that you are here, I mean, G uh, can be written in terms of uh, slower parameters, then it is, uh, can be written this way. So G, when the, in the slower condition, G is also can be smaller than one. 
But here, this delta one, delta two is the next order. There's all the parameters here. Delta two can does not need to be smaller than epsilon. It can have the, it can be the same order. That's the point. So it is it's called a generalized slower condition. So anyway, also they uh, also, okay. This is an example for the generalized slower approximations. So with the potential and uh, if there is a, some step kind of a uh, uh, flux features is given, then the exact calculation is a solid line. But with these uh, approximations, the textual line gives a very good approximation. Right? They match very well. But we want to use this relation to the inverse way. So there is inverse formula. I mean, in the previously, when f is given, the power spectrum is calculated. But in other way, power spectrum is given. This f is can be also obtained by integrating its power spectrum. That is called inverse formula. Also in this 2005 paper, then what well, this is all the true for the first order of G. So it so then when power spectrum is given, but the, the other way the same power spectrum is given, then we can obtain this F in terms of K. Then with this F, we can obtain because F is given, then from these uh, relations, H dot and the phi dot squared in single scalar field, phi dot. We can replace pi dot with this f, and f is known. Then we can find this uh, differential equations and integrate to find the h. So h in terms of uh, psi, psi is uh, uh, conformal time. So anyway, we, we find this one relations. And the second relation is also we can f is known. We can find this uh, phi scalar field value in terms of this uh, psi by integrating these relations. And five phi, phi psi is obtained. And also this potential in terms of psi is obtained. Then by the, e eliminating this psi, psi, we can find this potential phi in terms of phi. So it's a very similar, but we use more generalized formula for these uh, relations. So in this, uh, with this relation can be applied to slower inflation, but not just the slow. The, the general slower, which means that next order slower parameter does not need to be smaller than first order one. So, for example, let's say the simplest one is a power law form is given, power spectrum is given as a power law form like this P0 and the NS. Then, using the this uh, uh, reconstruction method, we can find this F squared first. So, basically, we can find the analytic. We integrate the formula and find F squared is just uh, uh, this power form of the psi in terms of psi. And the H squared is given this way. And also delta phi, phi scalar field value also can be given by this hypersine inverse. And then the finally, the potential in terms of phi is given by some complicated way, uh, hypertensant and some things. Well, but in some limit, we can go to some limit. Beta, well, beta is defined by some, uh, where is it? Beta is defined by this way, AS and HI something, into the constant. So there is a free undetermined constant here. So depending on the values, we can divide two limits. Beta is larger than this value. Then this potential is approximated as, so HI squared times one minus delta phi squared which means that H is almost uh, constant. So this is a vacuum dominated potential and uh, uh, there is a deviation by this uh, pi squared, by, which gives a concave potentials and uh, in the vacuum dominated uh, background. So which is basically similar to the, uh, this attractive model or I squared inflation as was said. So this uh, concave potentials, so which can where set is explained this uh, power spectrum with the NS values. In another limit, it becomes an exponential function. But in this case, it gives a large test to scalar ratios and it is inconsistent with the CMB, but it can give anyway this uh, power law form of power spectrum. So this is uh, for the simplest the power law form. But as uh, another example, we did some using used uh, feature the power spectrum. But this uh, we got from Blanca paper, 
as a some study for the deviations. But anyway, if we assume the power spend is a kind of this kind of oscillatory form, localized oscillation form, using this one, we check how much our method is uh, uh, successfully gives the this power spectrum. I mean, when this, with the, this power spectrum, we obtained, but in this case, we did numerically because we cannot find the analytic formula, we found the potential. So potential, and this is a V potential and the scalar field. Actually, this is a part of the potential because uh, we wanted to, com to compare with the, uh, okay, what? Right. Uh, this is uh, a power law form. So power law potential, this dashed line gives a power law power spectrum. Then our poten potential, which gives this oscillatory power spectrum is a green line. It's just a slightly deviated and some like this. This potential can give this oscillation power spectrum. So anyway, to check that the validity of our potential, reconstructed potential, using this, from this reconstructed potential, we again calculate the power spectrum exactly, means by numerically solving the exact differential equations. And then this, uh, this dotted lines gives the uh, recalculated the power spectrum from the reconstructed potential. And this uh, square, circle, triangle, star means for different undetermined constant, different uh, HI constant, what that corresponds to the for different color ratio. And we find that it uh, gives um, uh, the original power spectrum very rare. So we can believe our method. But Anyway, we extended our method to the more uh, power spectrum with the large features, which is, uh, this is the power spectrum uh, with the peak on small scales, not the same scales, but small scales. We use the four different power spectrum. This blue is, this uh, power spectrum is some 10 times larger than 10 to minus nine for the, or is, I mean, the, this uh, usual uh, standard uh, power of form. Red, red one is a 10 to three times a large peak. Green is a 10 to six times a large peak. For these three cases of power spectrum, we find this potential, reconstructed potential that corresponds to this uh, blue, red, and green. And again, to check the validity, we calculate, we calculate the power spectrum from this uh, reconstructed potential numerically. Then we find that for this blue, then this dashed line is uh, reconstructed with the potential, um, potential with a I mean, general slaughter, but dotted one is uh, reconstructed potential with just standard slaughter. Well, but that's the line gives a good yeah, agreement with the original power spectrum you see. For the peak is 10 times larger, but for red one, peak is 10 to three times larger than is uh, deviated this dashed line is uh, some away from the original power spectrum. But still the point of the peak and the, the magnitude is quite uh, similar. For the AP is 10 to six times larger, then it's quite different. Well, but for large peak, because the slaughter is uh, violated at uh, this uh, change, when the point of the power spectrum change is uh, uh, large and also on the top of that. So, which means that the function G just can be larger than one, so the operation mesh is broken. But still, the peak is 10 times larger than the uh, power spectrum is still gives a good, uh, good this, uh, reconstruction of the power spectrum. So anyway, um, so in my talk, in my, our paper, so we propose some more new method, and this is generalized to the previous uh, way, for reconstructing the inflation of potential. So this uh, one is for the single scalar field and with the canonical, scalar, canonical kinetic terms. So we use some decentralized slow approximation where the slow parameter is small, but the next order one need not to be uh, smaller than the first order slow parameter, which means that this function G is smaller than one is enough for our uh, this method. So we applied to a few cases and we've checked that this method is uh, uh, 
we argue is a very good uh, way to reconstruct the potential. So this, our method can be used in the future. We found, people find some power spectrum have, which have, can have some oscillatory feature in the same scale or at the small scales, in any scales that we can reconstruct potential directly. And with the, this reconstruct potentials, maybe we can have some idea to find uh, some theoretical, some theories, some uh, to which give that these potentials and also power spectrum. That's our idea. And that's all I prepared. And thank you. Thank you very much for a nice talk. Uh, we have a few minutes for discussion. Uh, is there any question or comment? Uh, so Mokri, please go ahead. I, I have a two questions. So first of all, are you assuming implicitly a large period inflation? So it, I wonder if you can get some results for small field inflation as well in this method. And no, no, we don't. We don't know anything about large field or small field. We just uh, mm -hmm. uh, reconstruct the potential in terms of the scalar field of phi. So it can give large field or small field, both of them actually. Uh, right. Because okay. uh, the important thing is the field delta phi. So I mean, the, how much field changes field evolution and the change of the potential. So that determines the power spectrum. So it is large or small, uh, I don't think it's not uh, imposed initially. I see. But no, I just noticed that all your results seems to provide the potential at large field region. Uh, because actually there's a two possibilities when we choose a right. phi, phi there is a, because phi is squared, phi that squared is given. So we could mm -hmm. choose phi that is a plus or minus. There are two signs, but just we chose the plus sign here. But if I you see. choose some minus sign, it can give a different, yeah, great. I see. And yeah, my second question is for your last two digits. It seems that I think it's such a growth of the power spectrum is due to, as you already mentioned, the violation of the slow rule. Yes. Inflation and having some ultra slow phase, I guess. Yeah. Yes. And I actually I really noticed the big advantages of assuming the GSR instead of yes. SR in your yes. left panel. So could you could you point out some advantages of this generalization? Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. This uh, when slow is uh, fully violated, then we are not much <laughs> advantages. Still, slower should be assumed, but the standard means that the next order is also smaller, much smaller mm -hmm. than first one. But uh, in GSR, we don't need to assume that. So that's the advantage. Mm -hmm. So the, this oscillatory features, this kind of power spectrum with the standard slower, it cannot give the mm -hmm. uh, proper potential, but GSR can give it. I see. Okay, yeah. so here the power spectrum change is just uh, a few, not the factor 10, not the factor mm -hmm. size, but just a few. I mean, you, you can see here from 1.8 to 2.8. So a few times the, uh, this amplitude. But we find that all the factor, factor 10, factor 10 mm -hmm. change is uh, fine for this GSR. I see. So yeah. do you know any literature dealing with some USR even? Sorry, I, I didn't cut it. Do you have any work uh, regarding even uh, valid in such a USR phase, ultra slow phase? Ultra slow, well, we tried, but you, you know, ultra slow violated slow right. is a violated. So well, actually, <laughs> we want to find uh, some method to which applied to the ultra slow, but still not good. <laughs> yeah. I see. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you for the question. Okay, Masahide, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Hi, Kim. Nice, nice talk. So, uh, yeah, related to the previous question, now le let me confirm that uh, uh, in your reconstruction model, given the potential, given, given the, the potential, potential. Uh, dynamics of inflation is uniquely determined, like attract. 
Mm-hmm. Is it a shoot or a, a, what, what, what Michael says like that? You see, originally equation motion of the scalar field is the second order. So usually we don't uh, specify the two initial conditions. Trajectory is not uniquely determined, even potentially is given. You see, mm-hmm. not only the position of the initial phi is not enough. Yeah. Usually we have to velocity. Yeah, specify velocity, velocity as well. Like but uh, yes. given the attractor feature, you see, uh, or slow roll, uh, usually if the slow roll condition is imposed, equation motion is reduced to the first order, then one initial value or initial condition is enough to specify the right, right. attractor. So, so yeah. yeah. Here, and uh, I see. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it looks a bit strange, just uh, you see, without specifying the initial condition, uh, even some stage attractor is violated, potentially is uniquely determined, reconstructed. So, mm-hmm. what mystery is behind? Well, I think I can say this way. This here, we also slower, slower, slower. It's assumed implicitly, not implicitly from the first. Slower is broken, then is, is this cannot be used, I guess, I think. Slower, because uh, the first assumption G is smaller than one means basically it's uh, valid for slower inflation. Uh, anyway, we assume that single field uh, dynamics. Uh, so G is more means I don't know if this is a correctly, this is a necessary and sufficient conditions, but uh, <laughs> if <laughs> potential is a slower inflation, then G is a small. We can know, but when G uh, is a small. <laughs> but, but when you, you have a bump, uh, maybe. Yeah, I, no, spectrum. no, no, not, poten- uh, not power spectrum, just a potential. Uh, we don't know some potential, you know. <laughs> so. Always slow roll condition is satisfied and the attractor is guaranteed implicitly. Attractor? Uh, anyway, 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 we don't know some potential, you know. I, I don't know why. You... We, we started from power spectrum. But, but power you spectrum. see, your claim is that the potential is reconstructed. Uh, right, right. And then we yeah. find the potential. And, right. and my, my point is that even if potential is uniquely given, prediction is in general not unique. Because unless we specify the initial condition, not only phi, but also phi dot, trajectory is not uniquely determined. This is mm. my point. I see. So, I mean, yeah, right, right, right. So here we have to assume slower. Okay. And then so, phi dot, yeah. yeah. I think ah, so, yeah. Five, uh, I see. We, we so, g- given the, the potential story. is uniquely determined and the prediction is uniquely determined. Yep, yep. Ah, okay, I see. Thanks. Thank you. Is there any other question? So, uh, if not, uh, uh, let's close uh, the first part of the afternoon session. Uh, uh, we appreciate all the speaker for a uh, nice talk and the discussion. And actually, uh, the second part was uh, uh, supposed to uh, be uh, open for 4 p.m., but it's a bit uh, delaying. So uh, how about starting uh, for 10? So 10 minutes delayed. Uh, yeah, so uh, okay? yeah, I, I'm a, yeah, I'm a chair of the uh, uh, next session, and oh, so I, I agree with uh, that okay. the, uh, uh, yeah, postpone 10 minutes for a uh, break. And so I will <clears throat> share some notification uh, slides for the audience. So anyway, yeah, we will take a nearly 15 minutes break, and let's just start uh, our last session. Okay, thank you. So uh, we'll keep uh, this Zoom connected so uh, you can still use uh, uh, this link for discussion. So see you later.
ですか So, are there speakers for this session in a n o w Joachim, are there? I'm here. Yeah, thank you. So, then、uh, can we、uh, check the presentation is working well?、Uh, so, I will、sure. uh, remove the, this sharing. And、mm -hmm. so,、uh, you can share your screen、uh, mm -hmm. and make a full screen and can check whether or not the、yeah, slide works well. Okay, now I need to move the zoom window out of the way to go full screen. Okay, you should be seeing my slides full screen now, right? Yeah, yeah, it works well. So, and could you also change the slides? Like this?、Oh, yeah. Is it working? Good, good. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for Thanks a lot. I hope my.、Uh, Internet connection here will hold up. If not,、uh, so in, in case I、uh, drop out,、uh, I think I noticed that because then the Zoom controls will disappear from my screen. Then I would connect uh, uh, in a different way and I would then be back a minute later or so. But I, I see. I see. To hold up. I see. So, and, and maybe if yeah, such a kind of、uh, some interruption h a p p e n frequently, then I think it also. Seems to be good to turn off your、uh, video, maybe. Yeah. 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 Okay. And so, yeah, you, you have for 15 minutes, and I will let you know、yeah. after uh, uh, 45 minutes、uh, using some、uh, chat messaging. Yeah,、uh, I will see that. Yeah, yeah, you can check.、Uh, yeah. Cool. Thank you. Okay. So anyway, the, yeah, Hyunmin、uh, is not here. So <laughs> any some <laughs> he, he, on... he sent me a message saying that he uh, uh, yeah. he uh, wouldn't be able to join. Yeah. All right. So if there is any unexpected uh, 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 some accident, then maybe Shintaro uh, could uh, deal with uh, so, such、mm -hmm. some accident. I don't know. <laughs>、uh, I'll be one also in. Ah,、uh, yeah, come on.、Uh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your. Uh, effort. Since the talk,、uh, we, since we have some minutes, let me just、uh, point out the name of uh, uh, the Jungang University in your first slide. Oh, <laughs> yeah, there is a typo. Stupid, stupid autocorrect. That, 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 is, that, is, that is an autocorrect、uh, blunder. A N G. Yeah. And that is a. Right, A N G, right? Yeah. You have to, yeah, so、uh, rotation. Yeah, it's it's right. autocorrect,、uh -huh. it's trying to fix it. <laughs> 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 Sorry <Thank> about that. <laughs> no problem. Okay, quite, quite important、uh, correction. <laughs> so, okay, so yeah, one minute left. So, I think it would be good to start.、Uh, This last session. So, thank you for the audience、uh, for coming back to the, this dark matter session、uh, of the uh, CAU uh, uh, workshop. And、uh, there are three speakers in this session、uh, Joachim k o v and Eric Fick and Sung Jun Lee. And so, as I said, I will leave a chat message five minutes before the end of the, each presentation. So, all right. So, the first speaker is uh, uh, Joachim k o v、uh, from CERN and m a i c h University. So, he will talk about Dark matter from cosmological phase transition. So please start. Okay, thanks a lot,、uh, Changzhu, for the nice introduction. And thanks a lot to all the organizers for inviting me. So the, to the topic of my talk is dark matter from cosmological phase transitions. So we are going to first talk about what cosmological phase transitions are. And then, among the many possible ways in which such phase transitions can affect the physics of dark matter, I'm going to、uh, show in particular two. So, the motivation for this work is、uh, like most people,、uh, I grew up with、uh, the, WIMP, the, the, the WIMP model or WIMP models being、uh, the most popular dark matter scenario. You've all seen this picture. This is the dark matter abundance in a standard WIMP freeze out model, where here, On the left 
the, the dark matter abundance starts in the relativistic regime. Then as the temperature drops below the dark matter mass, the abundance decreases exponentially <laughs> until at some point the dark matter becomes so dilute that dark matter particles simply don't encounter each other anymore to annihilate. And then the abundance uh, uh, freezes and remains constant until today. Now, for a long time, that scenario has been particularly popular because the observed relic abundance that we measure in cosmology can, uh, depends on basically one parameter, which is the velocity averaged uh, dark matter annihilation cross section. And if you plug in the measured number for that parameter in the WIMP model, then we find that that number is achieved typically for TEV scale new physics or electroweak scale new physics. Now, since we've uh, looked for this type of dark matter for several decades now, but haven't seen it yet, neither directly nor indirectly nor at colliders, um, the model is still alive, but it's certainly also a good time now to look for alternative scenarios of dark matter. And that's precisely what I'm going to do in this talk. So I'm going to talk about what the presence of cosmological phase transitions can do for the abundance of dark matter. <clears throat> and the two scenarios that I'm going to focus in particular is a scenario called filtered dark matter, where a first order phase transition um, controls the abundance of a particle species. And in the second part of the talk, I'm going to uh, talk about a mechanism by which phase transitions can form primordial black holes. Either primordial black holes as a dark matter candidate or primordial black holes for other applications in cosmology. We'll talk about what primordial black holes are going to be good for. Okay, so let me first uh, get started with some general introduction to phase transitions. Um, this is the phase transition that we are most familiar with in our everyday lives, when water turns from its liquid form into its gaseous form. <clears throat> in a more scientific way, the phase diagram of water on the horizontal axis in this so-called phase diagram is the temperature, on the vertical axis is the pressure. Um, you see here at standard pressure of uh, 100 kilopascal, we see the usual transition from ice to water at zero degrees and from water to uh, gas at 100 degrees. And then along these black lines here, this is where first order phase transitions happen. Now, I call this a phase transition in everyday life. In a physicist's everyday life, things are sometimes a bit more complicated. So that is a phase transition that physicists often encounter in their daily work life. That's the QCD phase transition where the parameters on the vertical and horizontal axis are now the temperature and the chemical potential or the net baryon number. And that phase diagram is much less well understood than that of water, obviously, because it's much harder to probe. For instance, here in the early universe, we are probing the low baryon number, but high temperature region. In objects like neutron stars, we are probing the high baryon number, but low temperature region. And then at colliders, we are trying to probe the region in between in an attempt to, in particular, determine the properties of this transition here between the confined phase of QCD and the quark gluon plasma, and possibly any other phases that exist in this diagram. Now, in order to describe a phase transition, one usually introduces an order parameter. An order parameter is simply a quantity that measures how the system changes across the phase transition. By definition, a phase transition implies a significant change in the macroscopic properties of a system. And this change must somehow be parameterized. And the parameter we choose for that is called the order parameter. That's not necessarily a, new, a unique parameter. But for the liquid gas transition, a suitable order parameter could be the density of the uh, matter. And for the QCD phase transition, a suitable order parameter could be the value of the quark condensate Q bar Q. So here is a sketch of how a first order phase transition proceeds. So what's shown here is the energy of the system as a function of the order parameter. At high temperatures, here the red curve, the let's call it potential of the system is such that the minimum sits here at the origin of this coordinate system. But then as temperature drops, 
a second minimum develops away from the origin. And notice that there is a barrier between the two minima. So in order to move from what's now a false minimum here into what's a true minimum there on the right, the system either has to tunnel through the barrier or thanks to thermal fluctuations, it has to overcome the barrier. <clears throat> so, and when it does that, then the order parameter changes discontinuously. So the system jumps from the false vacuum into the true vacuum. And that's what characterizes a first order phase transition. More schematically, this can be written, this can be shown like this. In this diagram, the vertical axis is the order parameter, the horizontal axis is the temperature. So you see that as we come from high temperatures and go to low temperatures, that the order parameter undergoes an abrupt change. This has to be contrasted with uh, for instance, a second order phase transition, which is shown here. Here we once again have a potential that starts uh, with a more or less parabolic shape at high temperature. And then again, new minima develop away from the origin, but now there's no potential barrier in between. So the system smoothly rolls from the false vacuum into the forming true vacuum. And that's what's called, it's called a second order phase transition. If the order parameter is continuous, but its first derivative is discontinuous, and if the order parameter, as well as all its derivatives are continuous, then it's called a crossover. And here's once again, what this implies for the change of the order parameter with temperature. Okay, <clears throat> um, so much for this general introduction. Let me mention one more phase transition that's important, namely the electroweak phase transition, or as we now believe the electroweak crossover. Here, the order parameter is the Higgs vacuum expectation value, which changes from zero to a non-zero value. And the potential here is just the scalar potential of the standard model. At high temperatures, here the dotted red curve, the potential has one minimum, and that minimum is at the origin. And then at lower temperatures, it develops these minima away from the origin. And so the phase transition proceeds by the system smoothly rolling from the minimum at zero into the new minimum away from zero. So, now let's come back to our original question, namely what happens to dark matter during a phase transition. And one of many possibilities is a scenario which we dubbed filtered dark matter. So filtered dark matter relies on a first order phase transition. Here's once again, the standard example for a first order phase transition, the boiling of water. And if you think about what happens when water boils is that bubbles of water vapor form inside this pot here. Um, and then become larger and larger until they eventually escape the pot. Now, something very similar happens in a first order phase transition in the universe, except that the bubbles can't escape. So what I'm going to show now, and I'm not sure if this is uh, going to work well through Zoom, but I'm going to show you a simulation of what happens during a first order phase transition. So this box here, that's a patch of the universe. The light brown area here, is the part of the universe that is still in the false vacuum. And the blue region here, this is where the universe has already transitioned to the true vacuum. And then as we let this run, we see that these bubbles of true vacuum become more numerous and expand. They eventually collide until the true vacuum fills the whole universe. You also see some features here um, in the, so, sorry, you also see some features forming <clears throat> in the form of, uh, density waves forming in the plasma um, when the bubbles collide. This is important for this simulation because this simulation was done by a group interested in the formation of gravitational waves. But for us, what matters is that after the bubbles have expanded, uh, the universe is essentially all transitioned to the true vacuum. And all that's happening afterwards is basically like a ring down of the universe. OK, <clears throat> now let's assume that there is such a first order phase transition at some point in the early universe and that dark matter acquires mass during this phase transition. That's not an unusual assumption to make because most of the, uh, well, all the fermions in the standard model with the possible exception of the neutrinos um, acquire their mass from a scalar field during a phase transition, right? All, this, all the fermions in the standard model obtain their mass through such a Yukawa coupling. So let's assume a similar mechanism is at work in the dark sector. So we assume there is a dark sector fermion chi and a dark sector scalar field phi. The scalar field phi is the one that drives the phase transition. And the scalar field and this fermion chi is the one 
that's going to be the dark matter. So rather minimal uh, toy model, but of course it's easy to, to generalize this to more, gen to more complicated models. Now the crucial point is, because the dark matter particles acquire mass during the phase transition, this means that in order to travel from the false vacuum into the true vacuum, their mass increases and that energy has to come from somewhere. So particles that are too low in energy will not be able to enter those forming bubbles. This is also shown schematically here. So what this uh, rather busy sketch that I'm going to walk you through now shows is a, a zoom in to one of the bubble wall regions. The blue region here on the right is supposed to be the inside of the bubble where the universe is in the true vacuum. The bright orange region here on the left is supposed to be the false vacuum. And here in between, you see the bubble wall that's moving in here in this picture from right to left. So the bubble is expanding towards the left. So there's going to be more and more true vacuum. Now, if a high energy dark matter particle comes in here from the left, on the left in the false vacuum, that particle is massless because the wave of the scalar field is zero. On the right hand side in the true vacuum, the wave is non-zero and therefore the, the dark matter particle has mass. And we assume here that that mass is larger than the phase transition temperatures, otherwise it would be negligible. And then what happens is if the dark matter particle has sufficient energy, then it will pass the bubble wall, it will acquire mass. So on the right-hand side, it will be massive, but it will have lost uh, uh, much of its velocity. So it will be moving more slowly. On the other hand, if we consider a low momentum dark matter particle hitting the bubble wall, then that particle cannot enter and instead it will be reflected. So as the bubble expands, um, only few dark matter particles will be able to enter. The rest of them uh, will have to stay outside the bubble. Now, the thing is outside the bubble, dark matter can annihilate much more efficiently. <clears throat> so we assume here that dark matter annihilates essentially through this uh, uh, Yukawa interaction, just so that we don't have to introduce extra new interactions, but of course there could be other processes at work. But in the simplest case, we have this T-channel diagram here where two dark matter particles annihilate to two scalars through a T-channel dark matter exchange. And because the dark matter is massive on the right-hand side and much more dilute on the right-hand side, that process is switched off inside the true vacuum, but is active in the false vacuum. We assume that the scalar is in contact with the standard model everywhere. So what happens is that the dark matter particles on the left um, that cannot enter the bubble wall, they will relatively efficiently annihilate away. The few dark matter particles that manage to enter the bubble, they will not be able to annihilate anymore. They will be frozen. And that's the dark matter that we observe today. So that's uh, written here again. OK. So once again, because only few dark matter particles will have enough momentum to enter the bubbles, we, we achieve a small dark matter abundance inside the bubble. Most dark matter particles are reflected and then just annihilate away efficiently. And that's how in this mechanism, the dark matter abundance is set. So unlike in conventional thermal freeze out, where it is the change in the annihil annihilation rate with temperature, that freezes the dark matter. Here it is the passage through a phase transition bubble that freezes the dark matter abundance. <clears throat> Here's a, a different way of, of showing it in a slightly more quantitative way what happens. What's shown here is a slice through phase space. So the horizontal axis here is the distance from the bubble wall. The bubble wall here is this gray band in the middle of the plot that has here a width of LW. To the left of it is the false vacuum phase. To the right of it is the true vacuum phase. The vertical axis is the momentum of the incoming particles. So it's a, a, a two-dimensional slice through phase space. Now, a particle coming from the left with a large momentum up here, those particles follow a trajectory that passes through the bubble wall. But as it passes through the bubble wall, the momentum is reduced. That's because the particle becomes massive. And as it does so, it gives some of its momentum to the bubble wall but it is still able to enter the bubble just with a lower momentum. Particles that already come in with a low momentum, on the other hand, are reflected. So they move towards the bubble wall, then their momentum reverses direction and they travel away from the bubble wall again. <clears throat> and what's shown in the background, this uh, color gradient in the background, that is 
the relative dark matter overabundance compared to a thermal abundance. So you can see that here in front of the bubble wall, we accumulate an overdensity of dark matter particles, all the dark matter particles that are being reflected. Um, and those are the ones that then annihilate away efficiently. So if we had expanded this plot towards the left, then you would see this overabundance slowly fade out as annihilation kicks in. On the right-hand side, there's also a small overabundance, but notice that the way we've plotted this here is an overabundance over the thermal abundance. Now, because dark matter particles are massive on the right-hand side, the thermal abundance is much, 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 much lower. It's exponentially suppressed. So that's why you can't immediately see from this way of, of plotting things that the abundance on the right-hand side is much lower. But if we plotted the, the absolute dark matter abundance, the difference would be so, so large that you wouldn't be able to see anything on the plot. Um, now, let me see, uh, let me tell you just very briefly how we come up with this kind of plot. So we are solving this in the form of a Boltzmann equation. The general Boltzmann equation is just the equality between the Liouville operator and a collision term, where the Liouville operator describes uh, more or less the free evolution of particles in phase space, and then the collision term describes, well, particle interactions. And those, co those collisions, they lead to a change in the phase space distribution uh, that's different from what comes here from the Liouville operator. The Liouville operator is just the total time derivative of the, uh, the phase space density function, which we call f. And this is typically expanded in partial derivatives. In principle, that's a rather complicated expression because there's six phase-based dimensions. So we're going to make a number of simplifications. The first one is we are assuming stationarity. So we assume that shortly after the bubble has formed, the system in the rest frame of that bubble wall um, reaches some sort of stationary state. And we describe only the situation in that state. We also assume translation invariance um, in the directions parallel to the bubble wall. In other, way, in other words, we assume that in the region of interest to us, the bubble wall can be approximated as uh, flat. So we neglect the curvature of the bubble wall. Um, then we integrate out the, the directions that are protected by these symmetries. And finally, in order to make the solution of the equation numerically more, more stable and easier, we do not solve directly for uh, the phase-based density, but rather we write the phase-based density as some fun function A times uh, a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. That's of course completely equivalent, but in the end solving for that function turns out to be easier. Um, then the, the collision term, looks complicated, but has the same form as it always has in Boltzmann equations. There is on the right-hand side, there is this integral over phase space of a scattering matrix element multiplied by distribution functions that describe the density of initial state particles and poly blocking in the final state. <clears throat> and once again, we also integrate over the momentum directions parallel to the bubble wall because we assume that nothing interesting happens in those directions. Uh, once again, a few simplifications, obviously the same ones as for the Liouville operator, but uh, we are also going to neglect poly blocking because this makes these phase space factors here simpler. Now, to solve this equation, I'm not going to go in, in all detail of that, but there is a method called the method of characteristics which um, I'm not going to describe in detail, but what it effectively means is that you use the fact that here in this plot that I showed you before, the particle trajectories do not cross to, to zero approximation. So instead of having to solve a complicated partial differential equation, it's possible to solve a set of ordinary linear, uh, uh, not, not linear, but ordinary differential equations, one for each of these trajectories. And then afterwards, we just have to patch these solutions together again. So in other words, we are solving for individual particle trajectories. So that's how we, uh, <clears throat> that's how we come up with this kind of phase-based plot. And from this plot, of course, we can then uh, immediately determine what the resulting dark matter abundance is. And that's shown in this plot here. 
So on the horizontal axis is the dark matter mass. On the vertical axis, we've chosen as a parameter here, the dark matter nucleon scattering cross section, mostly because that's a parameter space that's familiar to most of us. Um, in fact, what you see here as colored lines are uh, existing and projected limits from a number of dark matter direct detection experiments. The yellow region here at the bottom is uh, the infamous neutrino floor beyond which dark matter searches um, can no longer be background free. <clears throat> and finally, the large purple blobs here, this is where filtered dark matter can give the correct dark matter relic abundance. So you notice, first of all, that there's a, fa a fairly large region of parameter space covered here. You also notice that it is split up into two disjoint regions. Um, <clears throat> the reason there are these two disjoint regions, that has to do with the complicated interplay <clears throat> of our dark sector scalar field and the standard model Higgs. Remember that one of our assumptions was that the dark sector scalar stays in equilibrium with the standard model throughout the phase transition. Now, in the simple toy model that we considered, the only way it can do that is through the Higgs portal. But that means that at too low dark matter masses and therefore too low phase transition temperatures, the only way to couple to the Higgs is going through off-shell Higgs, going through the off-shell Higgs to light fermions. So that is suppressed by both the off-shellness of the Higgs and the small u covers of the light fermions. Therefore, here on the left-hand side, it's impossible to keep the scalar in equilibrium throughout the phase transition. As we increase <coughs> the uh, uh, temperature, <coughs> more and more Higgs channels become available. So we start to couple to heavier fermions, in particular uh, muons, tau leptons, uh, strange charm bottom quarks. That makes it easier to keep the scalar in equilibrium, and that's this purple blob here. As we increase the temperature even further, it turns out that the parameters we need in the dark sector are incompatible with a Higgs mass of 125 GeV. Because, of course, since the two scalars couple to one another, they influence each other's potentials. But we have to require that we still have the observed Higgs boson in the theory. And that becomes impossible here between these two blobs. And then the big blob here in the bottom right, that is where annihilation proceeds to on-shell Higgs uh, and everything's fine again. And that is also the region that we are most interested in. And that's for the following reason. First of all, that region seems to be at least partially testable in the future. And moreover, this region extends to fairly high dark matter masses. Uh, look here, this is a, a peta electron volt, exa electron volt. Whereas for conventional WIMP dark matter, we typically cannot go beyond this gray line, line here, which is the so-called greased Kamiankowski bound, which is essentially a, a unitarity constraint on dark matter annihilation. So here we have a dark matter production mechanism that works in a mass range for which production mechanisms has been, have been relatively scarce so far. I'm not saying there are none. There are certainly other mechanisms that can make dark matter in this mass range, but this is like an extra one. Okay, now, before concluding on filtered dark matter, I would just like to mention that this mechanism can be combined in a nice way with the mechanism of baryogenesis. As you know, first order phase transitions are a useful tool for baryogenesis, especially in the context of the famous electroweak baryogenesis mechanism. And in fact, something similar can be constructed here. So, if we slightly extend the toy model that I discussed now, and not having just this one Lukava interaction, but adding some other interaction that affects the interaction between the fermion and the scalar, then that can lead to CP violation at the bubble wall. CP violation at the bubble wall means that left chiral and right chiral dark matter particles have slightly different probabilities of passing through the bubble wall. So in other words, the reflection and transmission coefficients for left and right-handed particles are slightly different. If that happens, a chiral asymmetry of the dark matter particles can form on either side of the bubble wall. So maybe slightly more right-handed particles are reflected and slightly more left-handed particles are transmitted. Then if there is some portal operator that converts this asymmetry to the standard model sector, 
then this can lead to baryogenesis. One scenario that we've considered in this paper mentioned down here is a portal operator in which we couple our dark sector to the right-handed neutrinos. That's an easy coupling to have because all of them are stinglets. So if that happens, then the chiral asymmetry in the dark sector can be converted into a lepton asymmetry in the visible sector. Once the bubble wall has swept past, that lepton asymmetry can't change anymore, uh, or at least, at least cannot be turned back into a dark sector asymmetry. So we, we like seed our visible sector with a lepton asymmetry and then standard model phalerons uh, eventually convert that lepton asymmetry into a baryon asymmetry. Here's also a plot that illustrates this. That's once again a zoom into the bubble wall region. The horizontal axis here is distance from the bubble wall. Left is the false vacuum phase. Right is the true vacuum or broken phase. Um, and we are tracking many characteristic quantities of the system here. But the most important curves to focus on is the blue one here, which shows the chiral asymmetry in the dark sector across the bubble wall and the black curve which shows the resulting baryon asymmetry in the standard model. And for this plot, of course, we've chosen the parameters in such a way that we get the correct baryon asymmetry of the universe in the end. But doing so was not particularly difficult. So there's large parameter space where this works. But yeah, this is more as a side remark that this filtered dark matter mechanism can also lead to baryogenesis with a, a little extra. OK, so this brings me to the end of the first part of my talk. <clears throat> I would now like to switch gears a little bit. We're going to stick to first order phase transitions, but we are now changing the parameters a little bit. So in particular, we are going to stick to the same toy model. We are assuming there is a fermion that acquires mass during the phase transition. But now we assume that those fermions cannot annihilate efficiently. Remember previously, we had assumed that all dark matter particles that can't enter those advancing bubbles annihilate away rather quickly. But now we ask ourselves, what happens if they cannot annihilate quickly? Then what will happen is that their overdensity will continue to, to build up in front of the bubble wall. Then we follow the phase transition a, a little longer. And then at some point, there will be bubbles moving in from every direction. and uh, we end up with small pockets in which the universe is still in the false vacuum, surrounded by lots of bubbles in which the universe is already in the true vacuum. And that overdensity of fermions that has been pushed ahead of all those bubble walls will accumulate in these small pockets. So this diagram here illustrates this schematically, the bright orange region at the center, this is the, the small pocket in which the universe is still in the false vacuum and surrounding it are regions of true vacuum. So we are now looking at a, at a situation more towards the end of the phase transition. Here, we have illustrated possible trajectories for the fermions. Only very few of them will be able to enter the bubble. Most of them will be reflected and will be trapped in these pockets here. Now, several things can happen to these pockets. First of all, these pockets could simply persist over cosmological time scales, that in my opinion, these so-called um, uh, Fermi balls, I find that uh, uh, extremely exciting and interesting scenario. Um, and I realize I should have put references on that scenario here, and I apologize for not doing so. Um, but the situation we are going to focus on here is that the density inside the bubble becomes so large that eventually a black hole forms. And we're going to study the conditions under which this happens. So once again, we consider here now a shrinking bubble of false vacuum in a universe that is already mostly in the true vacuum. And we're going to look at what happens to the reflected uh, fermions inside this shrinking bubble. Um, now, if the density in here is allowed to increase, at some point, it may, uh, the bubble may become sh smaller than its Schwarzschild radius. So in that case, particles can no longer, can in principle no longer escape. So a horizon forms and we've made a black hole. Now, under what conditions does this happen? To study this, we have to look at particle trajectories. So these rather busy plots show what particle trajectories in this scenario looks like. So they are quite busy, so let me walk you through them. Here on the left-hand side, um, we just show a picture of a shrinking spherical bubble. 
the different concentric circles that you see here, this is like the, the size of the bubble at different points in time. And the color trajectory here, this is the trajectory of one typical fermionic particle. It starts out here at the bright blue arrow. It gets reflected off the bubble wall. It travels, travels, travels through the bubble. Then at some point it will hit the bubble wall again, but since time has passed, the bubble has already shrunk then. So it gets reflected again, it travels, 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 the bubble is shrinking further, it gets reflected again and so on until eventually it ends up inside a causal horizon here. You also notice that these curves are not entirely straight, that's because of gravity, of course, because when a horizon forms, it typically means there's strong gravity. So we have to take into account gravitational pull here. On the right-hand side, the same trajectory is shown, but now not in real space, but in phase space. So we show here only what happens in the radial direction. So we show the radial coordinate versus the momentum. Uh, the left part of the plot here is relatively far away from the bubble wall. The right-hand part here is what happens close to the bubble wall. So the reason we've split this into two is simply because the scales are very different. So the particle basically follows the trajectory starting from the bright blue arrow here, moving from the left in the, in the near bubble region. It gets reflected moves away, gets uh, reflect, uh, gets, gets, uh, passes close to the origin, then travels towards the bubble wall again, gets reflected again, and so on. Each time it gets reflected, it picks up a little bit of momentum simply because the bubble wall is moving. So every time the particle gets reflected off the bubble wall, it receives a small kick. Um, but it turns out that the kick is never large enough to make it leave the bubble and enter the true vacuum phase. Here is a second trajectory for which the situation is a bit different. That trajectory again gets reflected, reflected, but here we've picked a trajectory where the particle eventually after several reflections gains enough momentum to break through the bubble wall and leave towards the true vacuum phase. So both types of trajectories exist. And in the end, the formation of black holes will depend on how many particles are able to escape as opposed to particles that are not able to escape. So here are, is how the global properties of the bubble evolve. The horizontal axis here is the bubble radius in units of the Hubble radius, and the vertical axis is the overdensity inside the bubble. Notice that we start with relatively large uh, bubble radii here of several Hubble radii, that is not in principle a problem. It just means that the type of phase transition that we are focusing on here are phase transitions that proceed relatively slowly, which is realized, for instance, in uh, nearly conformal scenarios or in other models that uh, can lead to, to delayed phase transitions. So we assume that the number of bubbles percolating per Hubble volume on average is very, very small, typically less than one. That's not totally generic for a phase transition, but such phase transitions are, uh, can be realized. And then depending on, on how big the initial bubble is, um, well, we end up either with such an orange trajectory where we start out uh, with um, no over density, so a relative density of one. Then as the bubble contracts, the density increases, 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 and boom, at some point, it passes, it, it uh, drops below its Schwarzschild radius and a black hole forms. Other trajectories do not have this property. For instance, um, the green trajectory here is one where a significant number of particles are able to enter the, uh, are able to pass through the bubble wall. Or the red trajectory here is one where a significant number of particles is able to annihilate before a black hole can form. So in both cases, black hole formation is avoided. So this shows you that depending on where exactly we're sitting in the model's parameter space, different things can happen. And what we are interested in is, well, under what conditions can a black hole form in the end? Um, now, let me mention once again some of the caveats of this model. I already mentioned that we require large bubble radii for this to work. Um, that's because large bubbles means there's a lot of matter in it. And this means the Schwarzschild radius is relatively large. So we don't need all that much compression in order to form a black hole. If we, were, if we considered smaller bubbles, then we would need a huge overdensity. And that would mean that 
the energy density inside the bubble would become so large that actually the universe would start inflating inside the bubble. And that would, of course, counteract the effect of compression and black hole formation. Um, but in the scenarios we are considering here, this is not, this does not happen. And as I already mentioned, realizing this scenario requires relatively slow phase transitions with less than one bubble per Hubble volume uh, in general. And this can be realized, for instance, in supercooled phase transitions. There are some papers that have looked into such phase transitions. Um, we have not done it specifically in this context. So in, in, in the work that I'm showing you here, we've been uh, rather phenomenological in our description of the phase transition. We've, so we've parameterized it in terms of things like the bubble wall velocity, the latent heat release, uh, uh, the bubble nucleation probability. Um, but we are now in a, in a follow-up work. We are going to connect that to an actual Lagrangian to show just some specific toy models that realize these phase transitions in this context. Yeah, there's also some constraints on the strength of the phase transition, namely the phase transition has to be strong enough to overcompensate, to overcome the pressure from the forming over density of particles. If that didn't happen, then at some point the bubble wall would simply stop and no further compression would happen. And then I'm not saying this is an uninteresting scenario because this is the scenario in which we would end up with these Fermi balls, which I find quite exciting but it would not lead to black hole formation. So we need a phase transition that is slow, but has a relatively large latent heat release. And that is exactly why we are, point, why we are pushed towards the super cooled phase transition. Um, yeah, moreover, the strength of the phase transition shouldn't be too large because if it is too large, then uh, inside the bubble where we are still inside in the false vacuum, the universe, might also start inflating simply because the vacuum energy density there is so large. And once again, if the universe starts inflating, that I'm not saying it 100% precludes the formation of black holes, but it certainly makes it much, much more challenging because now you need a bubble wall that raises the exponential expansion of the universe inside the bubble. That is in principle possible for relativistic bubble walls, um, but it makes the situation much more, much harder to realize. So why is this interesting? <clears throat> I think it's interesting because if we can realize the required phase transitions, we can make black holes over a very vast region of parameter space. Here's a plot of the typical black hole parameter space. The horizontal axis is the black hole mass, um, either in grams or in, uh, uh, or in solar masses. And the vertical axis is the final primordial black hole abundance relative to the dark matter abundance. Um, so let's see, where shall we start? Um, yeah, let's start on the left-hand side with very small uh, primordial black holes. Here on the very left, these would be, prim these would be black holes uh, whose mass is less than the Planck mass. Um, for somewhat larger masses, well, they can form, but they would ev evaporate very, very quickly. Here we show as a vertical dashed line at what mass primordial black holes would, be, would, have, would have evaporated by the time of BBN. Beyond that point, we start seeing limits because obviously if you have some, some strong primordial black hole evaporation going on during BBN or during recombination, uh, that is constrained by the respective cosmological observations. At later times, if that evaporation was strong today, um, we would see it, for instance, in the extragalactic gamma ray background. That's where this limit label today is coming from. Um, primordial black holes in this mass range are nevertheless quite interesting because what they could do, for instance, is um, they could, uh, while they evaporate, they could make dark matter. So if dark matter lives in a sector that is coupled to the standard model only gravitationally through no other interaction, then this is one of the few mechanisms through which the, the, such a sector can be populated. Um, okay, moving to somewhat larger masses, we are in the regime where primordial black holes are constrained by microlensing, where they are constrained by the non-observation of accretion. Um, yeah, and finally, uh, they, they would simply become so large that there is no, not enough mass in the universe available anymore. There are a few regions we've highlighted here as particularly interesting. 
the one up here, this blue line, this is this window of asteroid mass dark matter where, uh, where primordial black holes could account for 100% of the dark matter density. Um, I'm also showing here in green a region in which primordial black holes have been proposed as seeds for the supermassive black holes in the universe. Remember, we are seeing black holes with a mass of a billion solar masses, and it is not clear how a black hole could have grown to such a large mass if it was of stellar origin. There's simply not enough time in cosmology. On the other hand, if those black holes had existed already primordially, um, then it would be much easier to have them have a billion solar masses today. <laughs> And finally, there, there, there was some hint from, from the oval uh, survey here. Um, OK, what we are also showing here on the vertical axis is the phase transition temperature that we need to get a given primordial black hole mass. So you can see that the interesting region of uh, mass here uh, for dark matter, this is right where we think such phase transitions may exist, namely well above the electroweak phase transition. For even more massive black holes, things are a bit more problematic because we'd need a first order phase transition basically at BBN or below, and that's certainly phenomenologically much more challenging. Um, another important parameter here is what's shown as these horizontal gray lines, and this is the probability for nucleating a new bubble while the old one is shrinking. Remember that in order to form a black hole, our bubble has to shrink and ac accumulate an overdensity. And that process would be interrupted if inside the shrinking bubble, a new bubble of true vacuum would form and expand into the false vacuum. So the probability for that has to be fairly low, um, which is, again, why we need very slow phase transitions. The thing is, once that is suppressed, it's exponentially suppressed. So getting numbers here of order 10 to the minus 20 or so uh, may actually be possible. OK. Um, I. I think the, the time allocated is almost up, so let me summarize. Uh, I think the main take home message I wanted to send in this talk is that, uh, well, phase transitions in the early universe are certainly an interesting topic in the field of dark matter. Um, I've shown you one mechanism through which they can determine the dark matter abundance. There's many other mechanisms through which phase transitions could play a role, but I've highlighted one of them here. And I've argued that there is the possibility of making primordial black holes at first order phase transitions. Once again, that is one mechanism for making primordial black holes at first order phase transitions. There are other mechanisms. One of them being, for instance, the formation of these Fermi balls and the Fermi balls uh, collapsing later on. Um, but yeah, I've, I've focused on, on more the direct formation of primordial black holes. So that brings me to the end of my talk. I'd like to thank you for your attention. And I'm, of course, happy to, to answer questions. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for your uh, nice talk. We didn't uh, correct thank time. You. So yeah, <laughs> is there any questions or comments for Joachim? Yeah, I see Eric. Uh, yeah, Eric, can you turn off? Yes. Okay. Sorry, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, I um, can hear you, yes. Yeah, a uh, very good talk. Um, so, question in uh, about the black about the black hole formation. Um, so, you need just one bubble per horizon because you need lots of mass. Is that the? I need much less than I need much less than one bubble per horizon. If I had one bubble per horizon, I would produce way too many black holes. Oh, way too I, many. I, okay. I need I need maybe one bubble every ten to the ten Hubble volumes or so. Wow, okay. And second question is, if these bubbles start inflating, then they would inflate until the pressure drops and they would just shrink again and then they would keep on happening over and over again? Uh, possibly. We haven't looked into that scenario in too much detail because we felt uh, that that would preclude the, the formation of black holes. But yeah, you could end up in a scenario uh, yeah, where it happens all over again, basically like eternal inflation. Interesting. That'd be fun. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And is there any other questions or comments uh, from audience? Um, okay. Maybe audience can uh, need some time to think. So I have uh, some. Uh, um, 
There is a question from the chat window. Yeah, um, I see Michelle, uh, can the self-interacting dark matter cross-section uh, constrain these models? Um, let me quickly think. Um, now my tentative answer is no, because the self and the constraints on dark matter self interactions, um, they typically limit cross sections that are of order maybe a QCD cross section order 10 to the minus uh, 20 something square centimeters. Whereas here, the dark matter self interaction, they still proceed through relatively heavy particles. So they would be mediated by these scalar particles, which are not that much lighter than the dark matter particles. And therefore, my naive expectation would be that the self-interaction cross-section is still too small to be constrained uh, at present. Uh, but I haven't calculated the exact numbers. OK, and there is a question from uh, Poyan. So can you turn off the mic and yeah, turn on the mic? Yeah, please ask. Uh, so here the fermionic diameter is necessary assumption or it could be a bosonic diameter coupled to the scalar. Um, in principle, I don't see a particular reason why it has to be a fermion except that uh, this scenario where a particle acquires a significant mass during a phase transition that comes more naturally uh, in a fermionic dark matter scenario. Of course, you can also work uh, with a scalar potential that is engineered in such a way that uh, before and after the phase transition, one of the scalars has a very different mass. Um, we haven't looked into this simply because it makes the whole dynamics of the scalar sector much, much more complicated since the second scalar that replaces the fermion would then also contribute or could contribute in some way to the dynamics of the phase transition. So things would get more complicated, but I don't see a, uh, an in principle reason why it couldn't be uh, something other than a fermion. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for your Thanks. answer. So other questions or comments? Can I follow up on the fermion scalar question? Yeah, please. Um, does would a fermion affect would, would this affect the, the gravitational forming if it's a fermion versus scalar? Can the Fermi pressure push back the walls and prevent it from collapsing into a black hole? In principle, it can. So that's one of the constraints that I didn't discuss, but which we've taken into account. So this is also something. Um, let me let me see. Um, yeah, we have these. Uh, uh, on, on some of our curves, we show these blue crosses here. So these blue crosses here, they indicate um, where the gravitational pressure becomes stronger than the degeneracy pressure. But okay. yeah, th that is something that needs to be taken into account because we don't want, uh, so if we end up in a situation where we form a degenerate Fermi gas, then we first have to overcome uh, also the degeneracy pressure in order to make a black hole. But that is something we have taken into account here. It just turns out that for the successful trajectories, um, the density never becomes so large that Fermi degeneracy becomes uh, the showstopper. Thanks. Thanks. Um, all right. So because maybe if there is a one more case and you can ask, um, but yeah, if not, yeah, if not, I think it is the time to finish. So uh, let's thanks uh, speaker again. And Thanks a lot, everyone. Thanks for your attention and for the many interesting questions. Yep. So now uh, we'll move on to the next speaker. So Eric, can you uh, share your screen? Let me see if first get my video to work. Is it 
Yeah, yeah. So can you change the page? Okay, good, good. So, right. So the next speaker is Eric um, Kofrik from uh, Hebrew University. So he will talk about super heavy dark matter. So please start. Okay. Um, thanks so much for the invitation. I wish I could uh, be there in person. Um, so today I'm going to tell you about uh, super heavy, mostly thermal dark matter, but a little bit of stuff motivated or uh, very similar to what uh, what Professor Koch did. Um, and this work spans a bunch of papers, some published, some in progress. Originally started with paper with Yang Jin in 2019, and now I'm working with my students. Uh, my two excellent students, Roni and Andy Tai. And my second goal of this talk is to make sure I get through it without my kids coming into this room and interrupting me. So one second, I can't seem to change. Okay. So why am I looking at super heavy dark matter? Why do I think it's really interesting now? And so my intro will be very similar to the previous talk. Well, we know for the past 40 years, it's been no secret that the star of the show has been the WIMP. Um, of course, there's been other models like axions or several neutrinos, but a big, but the but the big star has been the 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 glorious wimp, and it, and it's easy to see why the idea is extremely simple. If we had in the early universe some two to two inter, some two to two annihilations into the standard model, um, then there could be abundance left left over. If we calculate this abundance and we parameterize this cross section to some coupling squared over mass squared, you find that you obtain the right uh, dark matter we observe um, if the mass is roughly the coupling times 30 TV. So if you put in weak scale coupling, it's like 10 to the minus 2, the weak scale emerges. And this is the Witt miracle. And it's been the dominant notion of dark matter for the past four, four decades. Um, and it's very easy to see why. It's simple and it's predictive. And why is it so simple and predictive? Well, it's because it's a thermal relic. So in the early universe, there's a thermal equilibrium with the bath. These interactions creating and destroying dark matter went very, very fast. And the dark matter density was determined by, 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 by an equilibrium distribution. So it was not at all sensitive to how it was produced in, in the universe, it's not, sensitive, it's not sensitive to what came out of inflation. Um, all of that information is washed out and it just becomes a thermal, a, a thermal particle. So as the universe expands and it cools, the particles can no longer find each other. The, this process that keeps it in, in in the equilibrium stops, it departs from equilibrium, and its abundance gets frozen out. Okay. And so this is why it's so cool. So again, it's in, it's insensitive to any initial conditions that happened earlier, and its abundance is basically just determined by what happened when it departed from equilibrium. So this is the strength of the WIMP. Okay, all interesting physics is happening when it departs from 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 e from the equilibrium. And also it's very predictive. Because the interaction that determine the abundance, such as this one, can also be used to, to discover it. And so this, this basic idea of things being in equilibrium and out of equilibrium, and us learning everything about it through its departure from equilibrium, has been a guiding, the basic guiding principle of cosmology. Uh, for instance, we do BBN, we determine the helium-4 abundance um, from this from, from, from this type of idea, we can determine the free electron fraction from recombination. And so this has really been a guiding principle which we applied to the WIMP. And so we've been searching for the WIMP for the past four decades also, and unfortunately we haven't found it. Um, of course, the search isn't over, but it really starts to make us think that maybe we should start be looking for something else. Okay, so then the status, I would say in 2022, and I could have said this for the last five years even, is that this dominant paradigm of the WIMP is being challenged. And it's really a, a great idea. It's really a great time for new opportunities. It's, it's really a great time for new opportunities to emerge. Because you think about it, um, WIMPs only span a very small fraction of a very vast parameter space in which dark matter can reside. Dark matter can be many, many orders of magnitude below the WIMP in mass, and many, many mass, orders of magnitude above the WIMP in mass. And for a large part of the of our experimental and theoretical searches, we haven't ventured very, very far from the WIMP. So what I'd like to show you is that even sticking to the same guiding principles as the WIMP, that it's a thermal relic, insensitive to initial conditions, and all of, and its relic one is determined by its departure from equilibrium, such, such dark matter can go all the way up to the Planck scale. 
And so I'm going to give you now um, a taste of recent activity about how a thermal relic can go beyond a WIMP, beyond the so-called unitarity bound, which I will describe and go all the way to the Planck scale. Um, there's also been work recently as WIMP, as dark matter can go below the WIMP all the way down to the warm dark matter limit. Um, but I, I don't have time to talk about that now. Okay, so what is this unitarity bound that was mentioned also last talk? Um, so what is the, the, the difficulty of going to super heavy masses? Okay, so if you take this relative abundance calculation that I showed you, what I didn't do, but I showed you the answer in the first couple of slides, can you take some dark matter's abundance determined by departure of equilibrium through this two to two annihilation? You parameterize the cross section by some coupling squared over mass squared. Um, and you find that the dark matter mass should be this coupling times 30 TV. So just plug in the largest perturbative unitarity couplings. So let's say around four pi. And you find that dark matter mass can't be much greater than a few hundred TV. And this is just a, Unitarity bound that was originally shown by the Grice and Comney and Fasco. It's okay. So a little more detail, what is happening? So, so if there's a larger cross section, it annihilates more. It annihilates way more the dark matter. So dark matter can stay in, in equilibrium longer and depart with a smaller number of dark matter particles. So if there are fewer dark matter particles, and this particle makes up the whole abundance of dark matter, then it has to be much heavier. Then it has to be heavier because we know the total energy density and we need to match total energy density that we observe now. Okay, so fewer dark matter particles at freeze out meant that the dark matter mass must much must be much heavier. And so the idea is just because of unitarity, cross sections are never incredibly large. And so annihilations are never efficient enough to produce heavier dark matter. And so to motivate the first two examples, I'll tell you about how we go above. Um, the thermal unitarity bound, or the so-called thermal unitarity bound, let's consider um, the process we have so far as which we have the relative bound is determined by two dark matter particles annihilating. And so this rate of a dark matter particle to, to, to annihilate with itself, well, the rate is proportional to a dark matter density because it needs to find itself to an, another particle itself to annihilate. So the rate goes like dark matter density times this cross-section. But when the dark matter becomes non relativistic and, it, and it's annihilating itself away, its abundance becomes very rare. It becomes both been suppressed. So this process is not very efficient in reducing the total dark matter density, right? Because, it, because itself, it's increasing dark matter density and it becomes rare, so it stops happening. And so the first idea is very simple. What if instead of dark matter annihilating against itself to destroy itself, what if dark matter needs to find a different particle? And if particles are in, are in equilibrium, then light particles are very, very abundant. So if this annihilation process, let's say dark matter, light particle, let's say some center model bath particle goes to two other particles, this rate is not becoming Boltzmann suppressed as the dark matter density becomes reduced. So perhaps if you look for different dark matter candidates in which this is the type of process that, that reduces the dark matter abundance, then this can produce perhaps much heavier dark matter. It's a very efficient process. Okay, so given these, this, this idea, let's look at example number one. First example number one is what we call zombies. So consider there's a dark matter particle annihilates off of some lighter particle, zeta, which I'm gonna call a zombie, I'll tell you why in a second, and it goes into two more zeta particles or zombies. Now we call it a, a zombie process, or a zombie dark matter, because what happens is a zombie comes in, finds a dark matter, eats it and turns it back into a zombie. And so the dark matter would just be whatever these dark matters so-called sur survive this uh, zombie apocalypse. And okay, so in order for this to go to heavy dark matter, in order for dark, this process to be very efficient at reducing the dark matter density and staying in equilibrium for a long time, the zombie has to be lighter than the dark matter. If it's lighter than the dark matter and it's in equilibrium, then it'll be more abundant. We also require that the dark matter mass be less than three times the zombie mass. And that essentially is so the dark matter itself would be stable because I can move this zombie particle to this side of this diagram, whatever this blob is, and dark matter would then decay to three zombies and it wouldn't be dark matter, it'd just be a very maybe long lived relic, but not long enough to be dark matter. And so we pose that the dark matter mass has to be greater than the zombie mass and less than three times the zombie mass. And I've always wanted to do a dark matter simulation in the early universe. And um, I think I kind of succeeded in doing it. So here's my zombie apocalypse. You see the red guys are the dark matter, not so happy. The zombies are the, the green of the zombies. After the dark matter and zombies begin to annihilate each other, you're left with a few dark matter particles and zombies. 
And so it's very easy to build a model of, of this. So we built a model in which the zombie, the zombies in the dark matter communicate through through some through some through some Yukawa coupling, through some scalar S that gives you Yukawa coupling. And the zombies are in equilibrium with the center of bath through a, a Z prime. We he, we took U and E minus E minus mu, you could take U and B minus L um, or something similar. The model itself is not important, just want to show you that that it's very simple just to just come up with, with the model. And so the model is a little complicated. It has it's complicated. It's, it's, it's very rich. It has different phases, uh, different uh, depending on the parameters of what phase out my look at. And I suggest I, I hope that maybe you can look at the paper and check it out. I don't have time to go through all in detail, but but what happens is because the here 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 we took the zombie mass to be half the mass of the dark matter, and the dark matter can stay in equilibrium for a very long time. Um, and and uh, you'll find that, that the dark matter mass, if you solve the right ones, can do it kind of uh, semi-analytically. You'll find that dark matter mass predicted is actually quite, quite heavy. And so what I'll show you here is a phase diagram of, of where the dark matter mass might be. So on the y-axis is the rate at which zombies maintain equilibrium with center of death. On the x-axis is the rate at which the zombie process happens. And here I've shown uh, Contours of constant dark matter mass. So here's 10 to the 6 GV, here's 10 to the 8 GV, 10 to 9 GV, even 10 to the 14 GV. And you can see this blue line here. So this blue line here corresponds to a dark matter candidate that was in thermal equilibrium the, the whole time. The relative abundance is determined uh, by this process here. And you see that you go well beyond the unitarity bound that, uh, that we previously had for the WIMP. Dark matter mass can be 10 to the 9 GV and still be a thermal relic. And even so, um, if you were willing to change cosmology a little bit, so this here, here the zombie will dominate the energy of the universe and create an entropy dump on dark matter mass can be as large as 10 to the 14 GB. But, but still, even within a thermal relic with standard cosmology, an interaction is just determined by how it froze out from the bath, with this is relic one is determined by just how it fro froze, froze out from the bath, you still get a, a very predictive dark matter well beyond the unitary down. And which is, this is gonna be a theme for the, this and the next model is that the zombies, when they freeze out, they're too abundant, right? Because they're, because they're lighter than dark matter. Um, they're super heavy. Um, they're not that much lighter, but they're lighter than dark matter. And so therefore they're, they're, they're more abundant. So, 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 so the zombie particles themselves will freeze out with a large abundance, more than dark matter. So they actually need to be metastable. But if the zombies are matter stable, then the dark matter itself is matter stable. And so what you'll find here is that in, in all these zombie models in which you go beyond the entirety bound, the dark matter itself is not completely stable, but just super long lived. And this points to a very strong interdetection signal, um, uh, which we can uh, see in, in, in future experiments. So example number two is, is what we call chain, chain dark matter. So again, um, the same concept of scattering off a light abundant the center of the particle. Um, let's consider a chain. So what we have here is n dark matter particles, one, two n. They scatter off a light center of the particle, which is very abundant. So each one of these processes are very efficient. And for simplicity, we'll take these all these dark matter particles that have the same mass. So each one of these processes is very efficient. Although overall, it doesn't change the total number of chi number. So it just converts from one to another. So we also need to impose that the last particle in this chain is unstable in the case into the standard model. And so this will reduce the total number of chi particles in, in the bath. And so why, why do we need a chain? Well, if I just consider this chi one and chi two particle where chi two is unstable, then again, I move this particle here to the right side of the diagram and you see that the dark matter of chi one will just be too unstable to be dark matter. And so what the chain does, it just creates a very large phase space needed for the decay of the one to happen. Because the one in order to decay needs to go first to the two, then go through the three, then the four, and the end, and it's one in the end. So it makes dark matter super stable because of all large phase space in the final state. And so numerically, before we solve the whole chain, let me just show you what would happen if you just consider the two particle case. Well, if I solve for what is the dark matter abundance when it froze out and assume for some reason it was miraculously stable, you'll find that for a reasonable size cross-section, like one over the dark matter mass squared, you'll find the dark matter mass is the right abundance, assuming I can evolve it now and do it in the K, would be 10 to the 14 GV. 
Okay, so, so very easily, this process predicts super duper heavy dark matter for a thermal process, which freeze out is happening off the center of the model. So also super predictive, so it tells you how you can couple it. But, but, but we do have a chain, so it's a little more complicated. And so one way to think about this chain, instead of solving a bunch of n coupled Boltzmann equations, really this is kind of like a diffusion equation in which dark matter is randomly moving between different states in the early universe. Think about it as like a random walk, on the left-hand side is a wall, dark matter can't go anymore. And the right-hand side is a cliff, in which the nth particle is decaying. And so instead, instead of solving this n chain of n coupled Boltzmann equations for each dark matter candidate, we can simply just solve a, a diffusion equation. And when we do this and solve the equation for dark matter abundance, here, I'll show you this plot's a little complicated, but here is a, on the, on the right-hand, on the y-axis is the number of particles in the chain and M is the dark matter mass. And here are some couplings in this model that we had. And so the reason why you need a large number of particles is to ensure that dark matter is stable. And the dark matter gets heavier and heavier, its lifetime becomes shorter and shorter. So you need more and more particles in a chain. And so what we found for a very simple model that we had, that assuming we want to stay again within perturbative unitarity, that to get to 10 to the 13 GV dark matter mass, for a coupling of order one, you need roughly around 12 particles in a chain. Um, if you're pushing it to a larger, to perturbative a little longer, you can do it with 15 particles in a chain. But just let's say going to 10 to 10 GeV dark matter mass candidate, you can do it with just eight particles in a chain. And so this is also very predictive because the couplings, the term relative abundance, which is coupling to the center model. And you see the dark matter goes well, well, well beyond the unitarity bound, which was which people recent, uh, were usually thinking about. And so, um, so in both these thermal unitarity balance, and we can actually prove these statements later on with our students. So in both cases, you had nearly generated dark matter states. In the zombie case, you had a dark matter the zombie case, and the zombie particle were close to mass. And in the chain case, all the particles were close to mass. Um, so both cases, they were, they were degenerate states. In both cases, the dark matter turned out to be metastable. And this you can kind of prove actually is going to have to be the case for uh, thermal dark matter beyond unitarity, for perturbative thermal dark matter beyond unitarity. And so all these cases give a very strong signal for cosmic rays, uh, which could be all the way up to the Planck scale in energy, even beyond the GZK bound. And so I think this is uh, one thing we should think about is how to search for co cosmic rays, let's say above 10 to the 14, 10 to the 15 GeV in photons or in or neutrinos. And this paper should come out, I hope it in a month or so. And so my final example in the last five minutes of my talk, I want to tell you something that we worked on called squeeze out. And it's very similar to the stuff and somewhat motivated by the other stuff that Professor Cox spoke about. And so before we were looking at kind of simple processes that can control the abundance, here we want to start with a simple theory and see what happens to, to the relative abundance. So suppose you start off with some simple theory like SU3 with one flavor, and one flavor is very, very heavy, much heavier than the confinement scale. This would apply to really any theory with a first order phase transition. Um, it doesn't have to be SU3, it could be some large number of colors, and also can be more heavy flavors as long as there are no light flavors. So it's a very, very simple theory, um, and we want to look into it. So, so this is an astronomy theory as a first order phase, phase transition. And the low energy states are the bound states. So there are the mesons, which we'll assume are unstable. And then the baryons, the QQQ and Q by Q bar, Q bar state, which are stable and are going to be our dark matter candidates. And so we're going to consider this to be very, very heavy dark matter. So in the early universe, what happens is you have the quarks and the gluons, and the quarks annihilate into gluons, and the quarks freeze out. But they typically freeze out, if, not typically, if they have mass much, much heavier than the so-called unitarity bound, uh, they'll freeze out with a very large abundance. And you say, okay, that's, that's not okay, but the story is not over because the quarks aren't the dark matter, the baryons are the dark matter. And so to order to understand what is the relative abundance in this case, you need to understand what happens when the quarks, they form into mesons and baryons. And this happens during the phase transitions. We need to understand the physics of the phase transitions. Basically, we want to know what fraction turned into baryons and what fraction of those baryons will survive. Okay, so here, here's the early stage of freeze out. There are quarks and anti quarks. They've gone through their freeze out 
are not negative to gluons, and you're left with some smaller abundance of coarse anticoarse, but there's still way too, still way too many. So they're, they form and the universe is cooling, they'll get a little more dilute, but they're still, they're gonna to be too far apart to recombine in, in, into adjuncts. And so later, when the universe cools, you reach the point in which you reach a critical temperature in which the rate of nucleation of bubbles, the rate in which bubbles forming of the confined phase will start forming. And this happens roughly at the critical temperature and they'll start to form very fast. And so these bubbles are forming. These, these gray dots correspond to confined phase bubbles. The white corresponds to the unconfined phase bubbles. And once these bubbles form, they begin to expand. And as they expand, they'll grow and they'll combine into each other. They'll, 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 and they'll coalesce. Until you reach at some point um, in which in which the rate of coalescing is, is slow, and you can roughly this is when the universe is half filled with bubbles, half filled with pockets. So here I'm calling these bubbles, and I'll call these spaces in which so you have this large area of confined phases, small areas of deconfined phases. Um, I'll call these things pockets, and I'll call these things bubbles. And you can calculate roughly when the universe is half filled with pockets and bubbles. It was done in in in, in eighty four. We estimate it as roughly what's the typical size of these of these pockets or bubbles, roughly the same size. When this happens, roughly m plank to, to the two thirds over the confinement scale to the five halves. And so, okay, so one way you want to look at this, the universe is half filled with the confined phase, uh, but also you can think about the universe half filled with the deconfined phase. So instead of looking at these bubbles of the confined pockets, look at these of confined phase, look at these internal pockets of deconfined phase. So inside here are these trap quarks and, and anti-quarks, very similar to what was described last talk, in which they can't leave the bubble because, because, because the bubble, they, they, they can't leave the bubble because it requires a very, very large tunneling rate in, in, in order to do so. Um, in the standard model, this is not a problem. The, the quarks can easily do because you usually pop out a slight quark, like an up-down or down quark out of the pocket to, to form a neutral object and leave the pocket. But in our case, all our barriers are super, super heavy. So it requires a lot of energy to pop out a very heavy quark, an anti-quark pair out of the vacuum to leave the pocket. Um, that, that rate is tiny, roughly corresponds to, um, similar to the, uh, to the Schrodinger rate of, of electron positron pair production. And so basically the quarks never escape. They can only really escape once they form the hadrons and leave. So now let's look at one of these pockets in which you have quarks in, and, and anti-quarks inside, and this pocket is shrinking. Really what's happening is the bubbles outside are expanding, but think about it as a pocket shrinking. And as it's shrinking, these quarks are just bouncing on and off. And so eventually the, the, the bubbles will get so small, or the, the pockets will get so small that the quarks come, and the quarks come close enough together that mesons and variants can start forming. And so what happens, eventually it gets small enough for the baryons to form. And once these baryons can form, they, they just escape. We're going to assume that the mesons are just unstable. But essentially, what's happening is that you have this very large, sort of the very large pocket of quarks and antiquarks. It starts to shrink, it starts to squeeze. It allows baryons to start forming, and the baryons can begin to leak out. And so we work through this complicated physics um, of calculating whether these rates of recombination or the rates at which quarks turn into baryons. Um, using binding energies, the quark pressure the, to change the wall speed, the wall speed, the baryon speeds, and so forth. But essentially, what you'll have, what 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 we do find is that the, essentially the, the quarks, the mesons, the baryons form some sort of equilibrium with each other, and the mesons decay very very quickly. And so all this complicated physics ends up being not so relevant. And what happens essentially, all the quarks and the quarks just annihilate each other. Except if for some reason there were more quarks and antiquarks in one of these pockets. There was some sort of asymmetric component in one of these pockets. And those can annihilate each other. And so although we didn't impose an asymmetry in this model, there's always an accidental asymmetry in each pocket just by normal Poisson statistics. And so in each pocket, what you mostly expect is that all that's left over in each pocket is an accidental asymmetry that may have formed when the pocket formed. 
In order to calculate the number of expected quarks for, over anti-quarks in the pocket, you just need to know what was the density was when the pocket formed. Okay, since I'm running out of time, um, quickly let's run this video of essentially what, what's happening. The bubbles expand, the, think about those pockets, the pockets contract, they allow baryons to form, baryons then escape, left out with just the accidental amount in each pocket. And if you calculate the relative abundance, and there's some uncertainty in this, in the sense calculating what's the size of the initial pockets, what's the wall speed, and things like that, you find that um, normally to get this to work, the confinement scale needs to be somewhere between between 10 and 100 TV, and the dark matter mass needs to be somewhere between 10 to the 4 and 10 to the 5 TV. So well beyond the, the standard unitary bounds. And so we're doing a little more work on this. Um, one thing we're doing is considering charged quarks. What's cool about considering charged quarks, because if they're charged under some long range force, like a Coulomb force, then the Coulomb forces wash out asymmetries. So it doesn't like an overabundance of charged particles. And so this creates much smaller asymmetries in the pockets and produces much, much heavier dark matter. Also leads to an earlier period of matter domination, which increases the dark matter mass. Um, we're considering different meteors to the visible sector. Um, there's also a gravitational wave signal. Um, and it's also been calculating more carefully the probability of quarks to escape from, from the walls. And here's a preliminary plot of considering charged dark matter of charged quarks in the pocket. And you see the dark matter mass that it predicts um, is typically much, much heavier. So around 10 TV times 10 to the 6, so 10 to the 8 TV, 10 to 10 TV, and so on. Okay, so just, just to finish, so there's lots of activity recently for thermal dark matter. Um, in particular, I focus a lot on the heavy, but it's been for heavy and light and different interactions and processes and the, import, and the relative importance that the cosmological history um, have, are discussed in these, in these type of works. These are very novel dark matter frameworks in terms of processes. Sometimes they're very generic models, just like a, a, a strong force with some color. Sorry, my kids are trying to break in. Um, and often a very dark matter points to a strong, very strong inner detection signal. Thank you. Thank you for a nice talk. So, is there any questions? Or, yeah, Joachim, can you ask? Uh, yeah, thanks, Eric. This this was this was really wonderful and super exciting. Um, about the squeeze out scenario, what I did not quite understand is, so your quarks and antiquarks still have the possibility to annihilate. So there must be some some balance between how much annihilation is happening inside these bubbles as opposed to uh, formation of baryons. Is that somewhere, can we see that somewhere in the parameter space plot? Is there any region in that parameter space where annihilation becomes too strong? Um, no, so what, what, what happens essentially uh, for, for, what, for what we found is that um, the quarks and antiquarks always have enough time to just annihilate away. And so you always push to basically the asymmetric limit in which, in which almost oh. all the quarks and quarks just annihilate away. So if for some reason you could reduce the asymmetry quite a bit in the pockets, then you would be to a region in which you need to balance how quickly the quark can annihilate away mm -hmm. versus how quickly the variance can form. But essentially what happens is this, there's enough time for the quarks and antiquarks to just annihilate away you have some variant from okay. formation in that case, but mostly it's just determined by, by the asymmetry. But you don't need a global asymmetry to begin with, but the accidental asymmetry that you have in each bubble, that is enough for you, right? Exactly. If we have the charge, oh. dark, charge quarks, then the asymmetry in each pocket is much smaller because the cooler wants, a, yeah. wants yeah. to the cooler wash it out. And, and we're finding it, it in that case, then it's not so simple that it's just it's just the asymmetry. Mm -hmm. Cool, thank you. Welcome. Yeah, thank you. So is there any questions or comments? Uh, so then I, I have just a simple question for uh, this setup. So can you comment on the uh, some the um, the evolution or history of the uh, glue world in this sector? Right, so that's actually a paper going to come out uh, very soon. Um, so the blue bulb tends to potentially uh, have a very large abundance after the phase transition. Um, and without the portal, it's stable and all overgoes the universe. And so what you need then is a portal um, to couple the blue bulbs with center model, which blue bulbs can decay. 
Um, if they decay right away, then it won't change much. But if they're slightly long-lived, then the glue balls will dominate into the universe almost right away. They'll cannibalize and then decay and reheat. Mm -hmm. um, that depends on, on the model parameter space. But yes, the glue balls are something very important that, that we missed in, in the first paper. Okay, okay, thank you. So if there is a, a no more questions, then uh, due to the time constraint, we'll move on to the, uh, our final speaker. So thanks again uh, to the uh, previous speaker, Eric. All right, so our final, uh, the last speaker is uh, uh, Sungjun Lee. So can you share the screen? Yes, uh, let me try. Can you see my screen? No, no, no. Um, it, uh, just a second. Uh, Hmm. Sorry, I maybe I'll just use. Okay, yeah, it I works. Will... Yeah, I try to uh, share my iPad Pro, uh, but I think because of software, some software up there update, I couldn't do it. So let me just use my laptop. Uh, okay, and so can, can, can you also uh, change the page to check? Um, okay. Uh, uh, yeah, next page. Okay, it works well. So yeah, yeah then our last speaker, uh, we'll talk about continuum dark matter. So let's just start. Okay, uh, so again, thanks thanks a lot for inviting me for this interesting workshop. Um, okay, so uh, I'm going to talk about uh, continuum dark matter uh, for this talk. And uh, so this is based on uh, the following works. So the first two papers are out in archive last year. Uh, uh, it's in collaboration with Chabachaki, Song Hong, Gori Krupp, Maxim Perstein, and Wei Sui. And uh, this will appear as the um, PRL and PLD companion papers. Uh, why do we have so many people in this paper? Because like uh, I was working with Wei Sui and Chabachaki, and then the other people working, but somehow at the same time, we are working on the same topic. Uh, and actually we are all in the same corridor. So we decide to just merge on and so on. Okay, so uh, let me move on. So here's my brief outline. Uh, I'll give you the introduction. Uh, what the heck is the continu gap continuum dark matter? I'm talking more about gap continuum and the quantum field theory of gap continuum and talk about the basics and then give you some nice model to tell you what, uh, What's, what's so interesting about this continuum dark matter and we'll summarize. So here's what we everybody know, which is that um, there are so many things of, about the dark matter that we don't know, like the mass of the dark matter, uh, the huge range is possible and the composition of dark matter, we don't know the microscopic nature and the interactions and so on. So the, um, here like, uh, there are so many uh, different uh, proposals of dark matter, also already in many in uh, this workshop. After the summer, um, WIMP doesn't seem to be working from direct detections. I mean, na not naturally working. Uh, so yeah, but so as I said, we don't know much about dark matter. So it's not even clear whether dark matter is a particle, right? So here I'm just wondering whether it can be um, um, continuum with mass gap. 
So continuing with mass gap, uh, we have never seen in particle physics, but this is not so uncommon. I mean, from experiments, but it's not so uncommon in condensed matter of physics. Uh, so for example, the edge state in the fractional quantum effect or like 2D icing models or sorting model and so on. Uh, so um, what about particle physics? Yes, continuum is also very familiar object actually, uh, if you are serious, uh, because the, the appearance of continuum is really common in, um, in CFTs um, because the CFT cannot allow any mass scale uh, and so it can only form a continuum. Um, and then maybe people, some older people will remember this on oh, particles, right? It's another example of gapless continuum. Uh, but actually, gap continuum also was worked on string theory uh, by Gupso et al. and Triba et al. And it shows up only uh, when you have a large number of these three brains stacked on disk. Uh, which is basically dual to n equal four suji broken into n equal two via mass of two chiral adjoint and so on. Uh, so this is like a viable theoretically uh, in QFT. Uh, and also gap continuum, uh, if you want, you wish you can call it gap to particle, so on particle with mesh gap. So this has been also worked on software models, uh, for example, by uh, turning at all or Pycoski at all for Higgs with small mass. And also, like uh, after the discovery of Higgs, like uh, I was worked on this for Higgs pole plus gap continuum. So, gap is uh, beyond the Higgs mass, which offer a kind of interesting off shell form factor EFT, which is different from usual EFTs uh, that can be expanded by operator expansion. This one is like kind of non perturbative EFT, like B physics of standard model. Uh, and I worked on this to hide the top partner. So how about dark matter as a gap continuum? So this scenario has never explored before. Some people tried on particle dark matter, but uh, they, they failed miserably because uh, they started with gapless continuum. And then uh, the result never form a mass gap. And without mass gap, there is no phenomenology. So what is the uh, continuum? Uh, so you, you see this uh, plot. So this is the spectral density. For particle, this will be a delta function, but uh, you get uh, without resonance, you just have this kind of continuum. So this mu is what we call the mass parameter. Um, and then you see that uh, this spectral density becomes zero at some mass gap. Uh, as I said, you need a, it needs to be gapped for even for dark matter because otherwise like uh, it will not be consistent with cmb or large scale structure and so on because otherwise the 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 mass gap around zero will dominate eventually and that will destroy everything so th th this is uh, the plot of gap continuum of this uh, uh, uh this spectral density where you see this yellow line um which is at the uv line uh, they merge so this is the cft continuum uh, but but how, how do you get the uh, gap continuum? Uh, basically, you uh, tame the IR behavior of IR divergence of the uh, CFT continuum. So it becomes zero and mass gap instead of diverging. Uh, so it's interesting. How do you get this? So I'll tell you about this. And then I'll tell you what's good about this continuum. Uh, but some of you who are familiar with CFT might be worrying that um, it often stated that uh, CFT and the theories with uh, continuum spectra do not have particle int interpretation. Of course, it's continuum. So there is no S matrix that, that can be defined. Uh, then um, you don't know what to do with this. Like, you, it doesn't mean anything wrong, but you have to like, build some very complicated theory, right? Um, and it's because by turning off the interactions, uh, the spectrum changes from continuum into that of the ordinary free particles. So you cannot easily define asymptotic states in a usual manner. Uh, so this means like uh, um, you have to think about differently how to deal with continuum. So here is our proposal. The, our theoretical description of gap continuum is uh, based on generalized free continuum. Uh, also, like this was done by Polyakov early in the 70s by skeleton expansion, uh, which means basically CFT is completely specified by two-point function. 
and the, the rest will vanish. Um, so using this object, actually you can uh, define, uh, you can um, um, find a very usual theoretical tools uh, similar to uh, that of the particle. Um, so as I said, generalized prefield is what we are going to use, have, have in mind. And the CFT is completely uh, specified by this two-point function, as I said. That's what you just need to know. And then uh, the scaling of two-point function will be like this uh, tricky object, two minus delta. Uh, this is usual like uh, um, um, the CFT dimensions. Um, so, Basically, the branch curve starts at the origin and specular density is purely continuum for CFTs. Uh, but uh, you want to uh, deal with the mass gap. Um, so let's consider um, generalized free continuum, uh, the, the, the free, instead of free particle. Uh, so in this case, the effect of a strong interaction, uh, if you have CFT, there will be some strong interaction and it can be captured by the fact that uh, there is a non-trivial continuum with mass gap. So you can write down this kind of non-local um, effective um, actions. Uh, then this is uh, basically um, um, then written in terms of like color name and um, decomposition. And this can be written in terms of usual way of uh, spectral density. And um, but this spectral density uh, showing you uh, the kind of the spectral density I showed you in the above with the mass gap. But here, uh, the generalized free continuum, um, the, the strong assumption uh, on the, the parameter space of the theory that we are interested in is that this effective description is weakly coupled. Um, so basically resulting in some continuum, um, free continuum. So we call this uh, field phi to be um, generalized free field. And then, um, we perturb around this generalized free continuum by introducing additional weak coupling to this um, continuum field. And then assuming the, that underlying structure described by this um, spectral density of the gap continuum remains unchanged. Uh, so th that's basically resulting in the weakly interacting continuum. So that is what you, we can describe theoretically. Um, but then you might wonder how do you know this works? Uh, like, have you have? Um, so the fast and quick way to check this work is basically um, our model uh, building framework in ads -CFT, so in five-dimensional theory. And this is supported by concrete example of uh, extra-dimensional models. So that's why we can be confident that actually we can use ads -CFT, um, uh, holography of the generalized free continuum. Uh, so that's good. So so let me um, skip all the details and show the answer. So for example, um, the, the Boltzmann equation so for evolution of dark matter number density, uh, which continuum is not clear how to develop um, this Boltzmann equations. Uh, but um, actually um, uh, when you compute all the, in the end, like with this generalized free continuum, the weekly continuum, coupled continuum, you can use the usual formula of relic density actually. Um, uh, with small modification, uh, you have to integral or integrate over the spectral density. Otherwise, everything is same, right? Uh, where this spectral density has this gap continuum features. So that's very good. So you don't have to develop a completely new formalism because uh, that will be really, I don't know how long it will take to develop that. Nobody has done it in CFT to deal with uh, continuum replacing uh, asymmetrics. Okay, so this is our 5D model. So basically, um, we are using the softwares uh, with this work to extra dimensions. So for example, like we are using the 5D action of coupled scalar gravity systems and using super potential method to take into account of back reactions. And this gives you kind of what calls um, naked um, singularity, replacing the, IR, the usual IR brain or TB brain. And then given uh, some solutions or spe um, special forms, you can get the mass get continuum, um, continuum with a mass gap. So you can, um, so how do you understand? Basically, um, 
uh, what we do is uh, in five dimensional theory in the five D bulk, like you get the equation of motion. So this uh, looks like one one dimensional quantum uh, mechanics. So if you massage this a little bit, redefine field into the, uh, using the work factor, you can make it really exactly in the shredding of equation form. And then if you remember uh, 1D quantum mechanics, if, if this potential, if, uh, so by the way, this G is the conformal coordinate. So if this potential goes, when G goes to infinite, if this potential goes to finite value, that's the continuum, right? You see this figure in, in the bottom. Uh, so indeed, like uh, for given potentials, like uh, you can check that um, uh, this potential goes to finite number and that is continuum. Um, so you might wonder like, oh, there is naked singularity. So what about quantum gravity? So this five dimensional theory uh, is okay. We take into account of back reaction and so on. That's all good. But how do you know that um, the quantum gravity will still allow this um, uh, potential to be uh, finite, wouldn't it be possible to make it infinite? Uh, so that might be worried. That is something we, we cannot address in this five dimensional theory, which is eventually also effective theory, and not very that the quantum gravity scale. Uh, so, it, but as I said, the string theory is like Gupta et al. and Trivedi et al. actually tried to see if they can get gap continuum. And they found that in string theory with these three brains, a lot of large number of these three brains uh, dis distributed on a disk actually form the um, get continuum. So, so this is something like uh, we can uh, assume this. And actually, uh, we, we are try also trying to uh, use uh, Bank Jack's uh, fixed point in Suji QCD. Um, using cyber duality to actually show that get continuum can arise uh, from purely 4D theory as well. But that's beyond this topic of this talk. Uh, so anyway, so, so what's new for get continuum is dark matter. Um, so, uh, so there are many interesting features of get continuum, otherwise I wouldn't give a talk. So uh, the, the, this can give very striking new experimental signatures in colliders and cosmos cosmic micro background measurement and uh, potentially also indirect detection measurement in the future. Uh, but uh, let me focus in this talk about one thing very interesting. There is a gen genuine, um, very strong suppression of the direct detection signals. Uh, um, so this can reopen the possibility of, for example, like G portal, G mediated dark sector again, like the the WIMP we know is like pushed into a natural corner of theory space because of the non-observable, non uh, I mean, because it has, we have never observed anything from direct detection over the past few decades. Uh, but because of the suppression, so you can think about this is like an inelastic dark matter, but it's, but it's like continuum. The inelastic scattering nature, which we call continuum, uh, kinematics that I will explain further, uh, so that you, uh, if you uh, build a, a weakly coupled theory um, in the weak scale, breaking scale, then you can divide the WIMP scenario, but replace the particle by continuum. So that's one in one interesting thing. Uh, that's why uh, there are so many dark matter models, but we try to introduce yet another one. So in this talk, let me just focus on the, this WIMP window. Uh, where continuum replaced the particle. Of course, uh, um, continuum dark matter is more generic, uh, more broad concept. So uh, actually I don't have time, but um, uh, I'm working on also conformal bridging that end up with get continuum or other different scenarios. So the WIMP miracle, we, everybody knows it. Uh, and also Eric just described it well, so I wouldn't tell you, but again, uh, so, so this uh, WIMP is pushed to the corner. Uh, so, so what about uh, continuum? How does it make things better? So first, uh, I mean, the bridge out is a really nice feature. So it's good to uh, revive the bridge out if we can. And the bridge out um, scenario of uh, continuum um, dark matter wouldn't be very di much different from uh, the particle at the beginning. So, at the high temperature above the mass gap temperature, um, 
the annihilation is in equilibrium. Um, and the dark matter particles are at the same temperature T as the standard model. And it's at zero chemical potential. And then if, as universe expands and temperature goes down, um, dark matter remains in equilibrium and do not freeze out. And then when um, temperature goes below the, the mass gets scale, then the annihilation rate drops exponentially. And so the annihilation decouples and the uh, continuum freeze out happens. Uh, however, uh, there will be uh, still the, there are two important uh, um, process. So dark matter, dark matter, and, and standard model, standard model, this annihilation process. But there is also quasi elastic scattering. Dark matter uh, interact with standard model and go into dark matter with standard model. But uh, the mass parameter of dark matter can be different. So this means that the rate of quasi-electric scattering of dark matter particles does not experience the exponential drop. So basically, they can maintain the thermal equilibrium between the standard model and dark matter uh, because uh, um, continuum, um, all the different mass uh, parameters in the continuum stage, uh, they have the same quantum number. So they, they can decay into themselves plus standard, standard model, right? Uh, so to illustrate how this works, so uh, we build a concrete model, g portal model. Uh, uh, and uh, to stabilize dark matter, we, uh, we introduced the usual G2 symmetry for dark matter sector. So let's consider, um, how many minutes do I have left, by the way? Um, 10 minutes. Okay, so let's consider complex scalar field phi with no standard model gauge quantum number. Okay, so this is our you know, gapped continuum field and the dark matter. And then uh, in order to make a G-portal, uh, we add another complex scalar, which we call chi, which is uh, uh, doubled on the, the, the usual attitude to left and the U and Y charge number. So, so then the, the interaction term, uh, so this, this uh, additional complex scale, scale up, which is particle chi, has this covariant derivative with d mu chi, delta d mu chi. Uh, so this one uh, couples to the standard model G. And then there is interaction term uh, with this uh, get continuum and this chi and the Higgs. Uh, so once Higgs get, uh, get the web, um, then there is a mixing between our continuum dark mirror and this uh, chi. And then the chi is coupling to G, G and Z boson. So this is how the, um, um, this G portal dark mirror works. And then uh, the, there's mixing parameter between this uh, con get continuum and this chi. So this cosine sine is the, the mixing the, as usual. Uh, so so this, this is a G portal effect for Lagrangian uh, between this get continuum and standard model G boson. And then uh, you see that, um, okay, so let me ex explain different things. So, so these two, I have two plots where first one I call rho zero is one and the other one is rho zero equal two pi. Uh, so basically this rho zero is kind of the um, amplitude, uh, overall amplitude of the, um, of the gap continuum spectral density near the mass gap. Um, so for example, on the right, and for that, um, what you see is that uh, the, the red lines uh, uh, that gives you proper relic um, abundance, 100%. And then, um, and then um, the y axis is uh, missing angle sine square alpha, and x axis is the mass gap uh, where the, the gap is continuum begins. Uh, then, uh, at the bottom, like uh, the dashed line is usually uh, the allowed this mixing angle. Uh, it has to be very small um, be uh, because the direct detection happens in anything. But on the right hand plot the, above this uh, green line, uh, this green line basically um, is the, above this green line uh, direct detection ruled out, but below this green line, so ba basically almost entire space, when rho zero is two pi, the direct detection bound is uh, satisfied. 
on the left hand side, row zero is one. So there is no, no even bound for the direct detection bound. Uh, so basically there is a generic race of direct detection rate suppression, which makes it complete and compatible uh, with the direct detection. However, uh, um, still uh, in the future, uh, before hitting the neutrino, um, um, it is a sort of background. Uh, basically, you can look at this direct detection. Um, if you want to search for like uh, um, direct this continuum dark matter, uh, just by looking at the energy spectrum of the recoil. Uh, so, but there's another interesting feature, which is rate decay. Uh, so because all continuum state are carry the same quantum number that I told you already. So, so there will be a decay of dark matter mu one go to dark matter mu two plus standard model, uh, right? Uh, for G portal, this will be dark matter going to G boson to some standard model and uh, uh, fermions and another continuum. So this will happen uh, continuously throughout the history of universe. So in the early universe, of course, dark matter is in thermal and chemical equilibrium with the standard model, but as the temperature drops uh, um, below the, the gap scale mu zero, uh, dark matter decouples from standard model. And then the total number of dark matter state is frozen out, and just like the, the usual particle case. But the mass distribution of dark matter state continues to evolve because dark matter can decay into another dark, uh, one continuum state in, going into another continuum state with different mass parameter plus standard model. So basically, uh, this is kind of the cartoon picture that you see the red line uh, is Boltzmann suppression. So as, as time evolves, that um, the spectral density want to go closer and closer to the uh, mass gap, right? Uh, however, as you go closer and closer to the mass gap, the lifetime of the, this uh, dark matter continuum state increases uh, because both there is a phase space suppression and also there are, there are pure state to decay into. Uh, so in the end, like it doesn't completely uh, go down to um, um, mass gap, uh, and there are like a few hundred of kb above the gap scale still left uh, in the later universe, uh, even when the coupling uh, that allows this decay is sizable. So this is a kind of decay I have in mind. Uh, so actually, if you solve the Boltzmann's equation for continuum, get continuum that we de develop, uh, you see that uh, so the bottom line is uh, the full spectrum. So in the in this uh, um, um, change of variables, that the full spectrum remains at the decoupling time, which is psi is zero, but then it picked, it moves and moves uh, as time goes on, as temperature goes down to peak, uh, peak near the mass gap. Uh, or, or from different uh, variables, you can see this. So the bottom line, the most spread one is at the time of decoupling. And at the CMB, at the time of CMB, you still have some like 100 KB. And today uh, it goes down to further, but still there is something left. Uh, so potentially, I mean, there is still a, a observable effect in cosmology. So. So basically, if the standard model particles are produced in the decay of this continuum spectral, like the um, the the fine, like this uh, uh, G portal pictures that I draw, uh, then the decay, of course, after CMB decouple can reionize re hydrogen, so drastically changes the optical depth of CMB photons, right? So maybe it's possible to see it, but more importantly, you can. Uh, uh, you give you the raw bound of the effective coupling. Effective coupling has to be larger than certain things, such that um, you, you, you shouldn't have too much um, uh, left in the con continuum spectral density at the CMB time. Uh, so basically, if you remember this uh, plot, uh, the red line is relic abundance, uh, then uh, there's this blue line, which is a CMB bound. So CMB bound is that the parameter space below this, uh, mixing parameter is ruled out and only above this parameter should be working. Otherwise CMB um, a photon will wish to have a, a different universe, right? But fortunately, uh, what's allowed in this region is actually the preferred region of parameter space where 
the thermal, uh, that this can be a thermal relic. So that's good. So what about direct detection? So, uh, so more details, um, basically, um, so, so the direct detection is a, a non-relativistic uh, scattering. Uh, so if the incoming dark matter state is, uh, let's say, uh, mu one, which is mu zero plus delta, uh, the, so delta is difference between uh, the incoming dark matter state and the mass gap, then the accessible finite continuum mode are very in the narrow region, right? Mu zero and mu zero plus delta plus Q, where uh, Q is the basically the center of mass of the uh, scattering. And then uh, basically the continuum um, direct detection cross-section compared to the particle cross-section is given by this. So delta is, remember, mu two minus mu zero, and Q is the um, kinetic energy of the collision in the center of mass frame, and mu zero is the mass gap. Then uh, delta roughly 100 kb in our model, and Q is about 1 kb, and mu zero is about weak scale. Then uh, the suppression is almost like 10 to the 9 suppression. So, so we are safe at the moment. Eventually, we'll be able to probe it um, not too far distant future. And what you can understand is that um, for cross section, you have to integrate over the, this, uh, uh, the mass parameter mu square for, for entire range of the uh, continuum original spectral density. But uh, because um, most of them uh, in, uh, in today's uh, universe is living very close to mass gap. So basically, if you look at graph, there's whole parameter space you have to integrate out. But what's left is very narrow, this pink slip. So basically, there's a huge suppression. So basically, this is the inelastic nature of the continuum dark matter. And what's special is that there's no elastic um, parts. Um, you can think that, oh, wait, may maybe you can put a lot of uh, uh, particles in elastic dark matters to mimic continuum dark matter, which is um, possible, but you need some kind of intelligence design to mimic our continuum. Uh, uh, but, well, uh, but, but there is also this generic continuum suppression, which is not so easy to mimic, but you can do it. But for us, it just come out for free. Uh, we didn't try to uh, massage this to get this this is general, generic features. Uh, and the future direction, I, I say, you can look for this energy spectrum. So the for usual particle DLD will go like this red line, but you can see some kind of deviations, right, from continuum. So this is like a, something like a, I have been minded to look at, but haven't done it yet. And the indirect detection, uh, there's nothing, deep, no difference, not much difference between particle case uh, because indirect detection case, uh, there's no continuum in the finite state. Uh, so the continuum dyna dynamics happens only when continuum is in the finite state that you integrate over the mass parameters with the spatial density. But here there is nothing, uh, the final product is standard model, so nothing new. But there's interesting collider phenomenology. Uh, but first, for low energy experiments, uh, again, uh, you, you have a finite state continuum stage. So there is a, a continuum suppression when energy is not much larger than the mass gap. So the red bound for this g portal dark, mat dark matter is very, very weak. So, so in this plot, you see upper right hand corner, which is red bound and almost uh, negligible, right? Rule out very tiny fraction of our possible parameter space. However, for the future colliders, right, like if you have enough energy, large, much larger than the mass gap, then there's no suppression uh, because you can access to the full continuum uh, uh, space. You can think about that as a density of state. Uh, then like uh, you can look for this. So for example, here I'm just looking for root s equal 500 GB and then so you can look for this kind of cascade uh, decay of this continuum stage into another continuum with different con continuum mass parameters plus standard model and so on, right? So, so you can look for uh, interesting mass distributions of this cascade decay, and this will be fantastic signal. This is, can be also done in proton, proton collider, uh, but LHC doesn't seem to um, uh, have enough uh, energy to 
get sizable um, signals uh, just from our pre preliminary study. Uh, OK, well, so could I could don't know. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm really sorry, but could you, could you wrap up at the yeah. top four questions? Yeah, so I, I, I see the, your page number. <laughs> No, no, the other ones are like, so, so this is just the details and I just want to show that uh, uh, that um, what's important for cosmology is that uh, the spectral density near the mass gap, and this is universal uh, from 5D model. Uh, so actually this is the final page, it's actually, I'm done. So, so yeah, so in this talk, I give you um, a new dark matter paradigm uh, with some, uh, of bridge out dark matter, where I could, from the the WIMP miracle, we just replace particle by jet continuum. Uh, so the first method is that the jet dark continuum dark matter is theoretically uh, and phenomenologically motivating. It's interesting uh, because remember, like we have a genuine um, continuum in CFT, and if you you be physics is CFT, uh, how you deform the IR. Uh, dynamics to get the mass gap to get something phenomenologically interesting, and also they have interesting signals. Uh, so, so, so in this uh, talk, I show you example where we revive the we, uh, the weakly uh, coupled um, bridge out um, dark matter, uh, which is, has so many salient features. Uh, but we replace this particle with continuum. And I want to mention that there are many possible models and I just show one model. So many detailed panel can be done um, and continuum collider physics uh, is totally new uh, and need, need some systematic investigations. And um, there are many more. So I, I focus on bridge out, uh, but you can have bridge in out, uh, bridge in dark matter models, for example. In that case, uh, you have a very, uh, very feeble interaction. So the rate in the rate, current universe, you still have the full spectral density left because the couple, by definition, interaction strength is so small, so they cannot decay into the lower mass parameter stage. And if mediator is like uh, uh, similar or lower than the, the mass gap, then you can have very exciting signatures. Okay, thank you very much. That's it. Yeah, thank you uh, very much for your comprehensive talks. So yeah, because this is the last two talk, so we have uh, some time uh, for questions. So uh, do you have any questions or comments? Oh, Hyunmin came here. So thank you for your talk. Yeah, I just arrived, <laughs> come back. <laughs> so, yeah. ah, so you don't have a question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I saw the conclusion. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, then I, I have just one, one simple question. So then in your continuum dark matter model, um, especially when you consider freeze out, um, so when uh, the kinetic decoupling between dark sector and standard model uh, radiation happens, uh, do mm -hmm. you have any answer for that? Uh, so the uh, uh, evolution of the dark matter, so there is a first uh, some uh, kinetic decoupling, so number density would be frozen, right? Yes, yes. And but still, dark matter has uh, some uh, elastic, effectively elastic yeah, scattering, quasi-elastic scattering, right? So and they have quasi-elastic scattering. So that's why uh, among the dark sectors, like, uh, they keep decaying. The higher higher uh, continuum mass parameter stage will decay into the lower uh, dark matter parameter space. I, I continue plus standard model. Uh, mm -hmm. Therefore, like the things that keep moving, uh, and then okay. so, so they maintain the thermal equilibrium between the dark matter. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. The the reason that I ask so you yeah. mm -hmm. is yes, that on. yeah. So so effect on power spectrum like uh, some baryon acoustic oscillation. So is there any such kind of uh, uh, some dark acoustic oscillations in, in power spectrum, uh, which could depend on uh, interaction among dark matter or interaction between dark matter and standard model radiation. Uh, yeah, so there will be some kind of small uh, effect, right? Mm -hmm. So it depends on like how fast this, uh, uh, this spectral density decays, right? 
um, also depends on how much it has interaction with some background radiation. Yes, so it's also the model dependent, right? Yeah, I see. So in G, G portal model, uh, uh, here, like uh, we don't think it's uh, large enough. Okay. Right. Okay. Also, there will be also effect on uh, uh, BBN and so on, right? Other cosmological mm -hmm. effect, and so actually we have to make sure, like uh, uh, you, you don't the, those are not killing the uh, models. And what we found is that actually still the most uh, stringent bound is uh, coming from the CMB photons, and um, basically. So, so, so I didn't mention much about the other ones, including BBM, but in the plot, you see some small parameter space. Uh, so yeah, so that's a good okay. question. And yeah. I think potentially, uh, so for now, all these are just bound, but I don't know, like um, uh, maybe in the future, maybe some of them can, in their small parameter space that you can look at the details of the uh, spectrum, then maybe there is some trace, yeah. That's a good question. Okay. So Kimiko, uh, can you ask? Ah, yes. Um, so not only the gap to continuum of dark matter, is there another possibility to have the gap to continuum visible particle? For example, this continuum, continuum spectrum particle can decay into the standard model pair, but uh, without uh, the observation of it but the future observation, very discriminated uh, structure. Yeah, so, so, so for currently, uh, uh, for this dark mirror model, continuum dark mirror model, we, we uh, impose Z2 symmetry by hand, right? So, so to preserve the Z symmetry in this model, and it's like dark mirror should decay into dark mirror plus standard model. Otherwise, Z2 symmetry is not conserved, right? right. Yeah. On the other hand, um, if you just uh, look at general generic picture of the jet continuum, forget about the mm. jet to symmetry and dark matter. So I worked on some, uh, for example, what is called continuum naturalness. Uh, uh, that, that's a title title of paper, and uh, in their case, we use the jet continuum as a top partners, right? And mm. then the top partners are. Uh, Actually, uh, in the end, like they can decay into the standard model particles. So, mm -hmm. in that case, like uh, that's also interesting signatures. Of course, depending on the mass gap, there is a continuum suppression. So this will allow the the mass gap to be around TB scale. For particle case, TB one TB uh, top partner will be ruled out. But for example, uh, gap continuum top partners. Uh, still survive, for mm -hmm. example, I see. because of the rate of uh, and but in the future collider or like high luminosity, like you can still look at that, right? Especially future colliders, you have enough uh, and energy in, in um, energies, so you can reach. There is no suppression in production. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah. All right. So. If yeah, there is no more questions, then I think it is good time to finish this uh, last talk. So thanks again for your uh, talk. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Sun. Thank you so much. And also Eric yeah. and Joachim, I missed your talk. Sorry about that. <laughs> thank you, Chan Chan Sok and yeah. everyone. So I will yeah, turn to your mm. uh, initial comment. Thank you. I will just uh, I have a comment for tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow. Uh, we will uh, resume uh, the gravity wave session at 9.30. So Song Chan uh, will be the first speaker for tomorrow. So uh, please uh, come again and see you tomorrow. Uh, Song Jun, can I ask you a question? <laughs> uh, you have a question. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Yeah, Thanks probably I'm, I'm old enough to learn uh, on particle physics long time ago. Yes, so, yes, yes. And your continuum